So first of all, in a case where there are so many coincidences, I just cannot get over this one. I think I mentioned it in the early episodes. If not, whatever. Linda Hoffman Pugh, P-U-G-H. So supposedly not related to Patsy Ramsey. Pow, P-A-U-G-H. I mean, okay, first of all, Pow is not the most popular name. Neither is Pew. I mean, these, okay, to be one letter off in the last name, I mean, what can be made of this? I mean, for those that believe the Jean Benet Ramsey case is some kind of psyop, I mean, these are the things that point to it. Why are these people, like Linda Hoffman Powell, Linda Hoffman Pugh, and her husband Mervyn Pugh, the handyman, their last name is off by one letter, and these are not common last names. We're not talking about Johnson with or without an H, or Jameson with an E or an I. You know, like, it's, it's weird. It's weird that these names are so close together. I mean, I don't know what to make of that. That's mind-shocking in and of itself. I need to mention that because statistically, what are the chances? So for those that believe it was an inside job, many point to Linda Hoffman Pugh, who, by the way, was the very first person on the Ramsey suspect list. So, if you believe the Ramseys are innocent, innocent of the specific crime, not necessarily that they, they weren't, uh, they, they might have been abusing their children in some capacity, obviously the, the scale ranges on to what extent, or just simply been negligent parents concerned with other things. Either way, for those who do not believe that they either intentionally or accidentally were physically responsible for the death of JonBenet Ramsey, what does everyone make of their intuition? Like, let's just say for a moment, just as a thought exercise, theoretically, if they're innocent, if the Ramseys are innocent, their go-to suspect, I mean, in criminal investigations, I mean, I don't know why we don't talk about this more often. I haven't even talked about this that much. I mean, obviously you have the mother's intuition, but there's also an investigative technique. If you just flat out ask someone, a friend, family member, someone who knew the victim, who do you think did it? The very first person that comes to mind is more often than not the true perpetrator. Now that's across many cases. So if you take 100 cases, that might be 80 or 90 out of those 100. That's the first person who comes to mind. Now that doesn't mean that that would be true in this case. That's just something to keep in mind that the very first, it's almost like the subconscious, before the conscious mind has time to evaluate, reevaluate, you bring biases into it, uh, what disbelief, I mean, all of these things, just the very first instant response. Who did it? Bam. The first person that popped into the brain before any kind of mental gymnastics were done or any kind of cognitive biases tripped or any kind of triggering or dissonance occurring, that first immediate thought, more often than not, it turns out to be the true perpetrator. I might have to do an entire podcast on that because that's a point that, that's overlooked. So again, that's if the parents are innocent. The very first person on their list is Linda Hoffman Pugh. Now, some would argue she had motive, means, and opportunity with all of the inside knowledge working in the home. And she, again, anybody who was in the home could have seen that bonus, which again, I mean, yeah, it's tough. It's tough. If the parents are guilty, they could have added the bonus amount in the ransom letter to make it look like one of their guests at the previous Christmas party was the one who did it. I mean, if they're that forward thinking. Now, it, it, it's difficult because the emotional state that they would have been in, even if they were guilty, I mean, it's kind of hard to argue that they were serial killers and they would have been completely 100% cold about the death of their daughter. I mean, I don't even think people who think the parents are guilty would argue that. So, because even if they are guilty, accidental death or otherwise, there, there would probably have been some kind of an emotional state. So would they have been able to think of that bonus about? Maybe, maybe not. I'm not claiming anything is true or untrue. This is mind shock. But 
some kind of disgruntled employee. And we're actually, that might be the next episode because Access Graphics has a laundry list of disgruntled employees who had a reason to try to get back at John Ramsey. Now, that's not to say that they would go as far as possibly kidnapping his daughter and holding her for ransom, but it's something to be explored because in a case that is as of yet unsolved, you do have to go down every avenue. And this is mind shock, the most exhaustive, comprehensive analysis of all true crime cases. But let's focus on Linda Hoffman Pugh for a moment. So... There's a lot of good information here on a candyrose.com. I mentioned it before that kind of organizes a lot of the known information. So she met Jean Bonnet when she was in preschool. She's from Fort Lupton, Colorado, or at least that is where she lived. She was the Ramsey housekeeper. Thanksgiving 1996, when the Ramseys were in Atlanta, Linda, Mervyn, and Ariana. Now, Ariana is the daughter of Mervyn and Linda Hoffman Pugh. They did decorations and washed windows at the Ramsey house. Linda brought the decorations in from the garage, but couldn't find artificial trees brought from the Access Graphics storage hangar. Linda and Ariana searched the house, found the cellar room door, which was painted shut. The next day, Linda's son-in-law, Mike, daughter Tina, and husband Mervyn got the trees out of the wine cellar and took to the bedrooms. Interesting. The National Enquirer offered $20,000 in a trip to Fort Lauderdale, Florida. The Pews took the offer and gave an interview. There was also a lawsuit... March 2001, a $50 million lawsuit, Pew v. Ramsey, which was dismissed in 2002. And this lawsuit, decided November 19th, 2002, right on caselaw.finelaw.com, Linda Hoffman Pew, plaintiff, plaintiff appellant v. Patricia Ramsey, John Ramsey, defendants, appellees. United States Court of Appeals, 11th Circuit. This diversity case arises from a book written by John and Patricia Ramsey about the police investigation into their daughter's murder. Linda Hoffman Pugh, the Ramsey's former housekeeper, brought suit against the Ramsey's alleging libel and slander under Georgia law in connection with the book and its promotion. The district court granted the Ramsey's motion to dismiss Hoffman Pugh's complaint under a federal rule of civil procedure, 12b-6, for failure to state a claim upon which relief can be granted. This appeal followed. For the reasons we will discuss, we affirm. The Ramsey's young daughter, Jean Bonnet, was murdered in 96 in Boulder, Colorado, and the investigation that followed received intense media scrutiny and public attention. In March 2000, the Ramseys published a book about the investigation into their daughter's murder entitled The Death of Innocence, The Untold Story of Jean Bonnet's Murder, and How Its Exploitation Compromised the Pursuit of Truth. Thomas Nelson Publishers, 2000. Hoffman Pugh's complaint alleges that the Ramseys libeled her, in particular in the following passage from their book describing the Ramseys' interaction with the police after Jean Bonnet was discovered missing but before her body was found in the Ramsey's house. And here it is right here. The police asked Patsy the same questions about who might have been angry or acting strangely, and she begins to think about our cleaning lady. Linda Hoffman Pugh had called Patsy a couple of days before Christmas, very distraught and in tears. Linda said her sister, who was also her landlord, was going to evict her if she didn't come up with the past due rent. She asked Patsy if she could borrow $2,500 to cover it. Patsy had consoled Linda and agreed to lend her the money. In fact, Patsy had intended to leave the check for Linda on the kitchen counter before leaving for Michigan. Linda would let herself in the house and pick it up while we were gone for the holidays. Patsy, see, the thing is, if that's all true, why kidnap Jean Benet if she's going to get her money? Patsy remembers that her mother, Nedra Pal, I see, I, again, I mean, Pew and Pal, really? I mean, come on, does anybody else find that strange? Had said that Linda had remarked to her at one time, quote, Jean Bonnet is so pretty, aren't you afraid that someone might kidnap her? End quote. Now those comments seem strangely menacing. See, again, I, I'm going to have to go with the coincidence theorists on this one. I mean, that kind of seems like an innocent comment because rich people... You know, guy works for a billion-dollar company. Her, uh, she's in pageants. She's in the public eye. 
I mean, yeah, what are you going to make? And especially how long ago was that? It doesn't state. Finding the phone number in her digital Rolodex, Patsy tells a police officer where Linda lives in Fort Lupton, Colorado. Patsy later tells me she was thinking, if it's Linda, it's okay because she is a good, sweet person. She is just upset. She may need the money, but she won't hurt Jean Benet. John Ramsey really needs a brain fingerprint scan, doesn't he? Because if this is all true, I mean, that's interesting. The police tell us that they will arrange for the Fort Lupton police to drive by Linda's house to see if they notice anything unusual, but they don't want to alert anyone there they are being watched. So they actually did a drive-by on her house? That's interesting. Death of Innocence, 19 to 20. Hoffman Pugh alleges in her complaint that the statements in this passage are false and that the Ramseys know that they are false and that they were made with the intent to create an impression that Hoffman Pugh is a suspect in the murder. Hoffman Pugh claims that her sister was not going to evict her and that she did not make the above statement to Nedra Powell or anyone else. Pugh did, she, so Pugh is stating she did not make the statement to Powell. She also claims that the statement, if it's Linda, it's okay because she's a good, sweet person. She's just upset she may need the money, but she won't hurt Jean Bonnet, is a deliberate falsehood because Hoffman Pugh did not murder Jean Bonnet. Hoffman Pugh claims she knows that this passage is a deliberate falsehood because Patricia Ramsey killed her daughter and wrote a ransom note to cover it up. And John Ramsey knew this and helped his wife in the cover up. Both John and Pat Patricia Ramsey deny any involvement in the murder of their daughter. See, you know what's weird, though? Isn't that, isn't that libel? If it's not true, right? If it's true, it's not libel. But if it's not true, she's claiming, Linda Hoffman Pugh is claiming here that Patricia Ramsey killed her daughter and her and John Ramsey covered it up. I mean, those are bold claims. Those are bold claims. Although, if Linda Hoffman Pugh was involved in some kind of botched kidnapping, would she say that to cast suspicion away from herself while also looking for a payday? I mean, I don't know. I mean, again, criminal-minded individuals, they might do that. The complaint alleges that the Ramseys repeated the false allegation that Hoffman Pugh was a murder suspect in television interviews, promoting their book and in the print media. It identifies no specific statements outside the book, but alleges that the unidentified statements constitute libel and slander per se. The complaint also alleges that as a result of these statements and the book, Hoffman Pugh has been the subject of heightened, unwelcome, and unflattering media scrutiny and has been exposed to hatred, contempt, and ridicule in her small community. The Ramseys moved to dismiss the complaint for failure to state a claim. The district court concluded that because Hoffman Pugh did not identify in her complaint or in her response to the Ramseys' motion to dismiss any specific offending oral statements that the Ramseys made to the media, her claims based upon statements outside the book had been abandoned. The district court then granted the Ramseys' motion to dismiss because the passage from the book that Hoffman Pugh relied upon for her libel claim was non-defamatory as a matter of law or alternatively because the statements in the passage were, no, were non-actionable statements of opinion. Hoffman Pugh appeals the district court's judgment insofar as it concerns the passage of the book, but does not contest the ruling that she abandoned her claims involving statements made outside the books. Okay, and then there's more legal uh, mumbo-jumbo here, but basically... It also mentions that the, because the Ramseys also mentioned many other suspects and Hoffman Pugh's name appears only once in the book regarding to uh, specific suspects, suspects ID, et cetera, et cetera. So that's basically the, the description of the court case that was uh, dismissed. So, and she was looking for 50 million dollars. Now, of course, if she had won some kind of settlement, obviously it wouldn't have been 50 mil, so that it, it's obviously inflated, so that, you know, settle for one or two mil, it looks kind of good, whatever. But, yeah, that was dismissed. So, interesting. Okay, we're about to go really, really deep into mind shock land. So, she worked for Merry Maids. So there's four people once a week cleaning the Ramsey house. Linda began three days a week, $72 a day, Monday, Wednesdays, Fridays, 9 a.m. to 3 p.m., some Saturdays and holidays. On October 27th, 1996, she received a $300 bonus. That's not too shabby. It's like a Halloween bonus, not even a Christmas bonus. 
On December 23rd, 1996, Linda took Patsy's paint tray to the basement. I don't, so the, this is just a collection of information. So what can we glean from that, that any kind of paintbrush or, or painting tools, supplies, whatever, Linda Hoffman Pugh would know their location. Okay, I don't think anybody's disputing that. December 24th, 1996, Linda called Patsy asking to borrow $2,000. So in the other claim, it was $2,500 on a candy rose here stating $2,000. So it's unclear whether Linda Hoffman Pugh was uh, referring to her sister. What being what was untrue was is that the sister was going to evict, or that she didn't ask for the money. Did she ask for the money, but not because of eviction? Again, unclear. We need brain fingerprint scans. So it would be repaid at fifty dollars a week. Linda's next cleaning day was to be December twenty seventh, nineteen ninety six. Linda was the first to tell police about Jean Benet's bedwetting. That's an interesting piece of information as well. So is Linda Hoffman Pugh some criminal mastermind genius and her plot, her kidnapping plot, we're gonna get into a couple different theories here. If Linda Hoffman Pugh and Mervyn Pugh, if they got into some kind of, uh, if they had other people that they were gonna bring in on this plot, and these other people kind of took it away from them and botched it and maybe were even possibly going to cut out the pews. I mean, this happens all the time with criminals. Again, the coincidence theorists, like, they really have a hard time with understanding how criminal conspiracies work. I mean, people get cut out of the picture all the time. So Pew here, if she got cut out of the picture at this point, or even if not, even if she was part of the uh, botched kidnapping, whatever happened after, who knows, would she seek to paint a certain narrative and point everything at the parents because again in most cases a large percentage of cases the parents are responsible for the death of a child that can't be argued so is she trying to paint that narrative here so she was the first according to this she was the first to tell police about jamine ramsey wetting the bed Another curious footnote here is on the December 23rd Christmas party, Patsy gave Ariana Pugh a Christmas sweater and loaned shoes. So loaned her shoes, not gave her shoes. Interesting. And the Pugh family had two keys to the house. Not one, so they, they had a key to the house like dozens of other people. And, and countless numbers of keys out there in circulation. But they also had a spare, so two. So theoretically, if she did bring other criminals in on it, she even had a spare key to give. Not, not that a, a copy of a key can't be made, but she already had a spare. She did give fingerprints. She did give blood. She did give a hair sample. And she did give a handwriting sample. And apparently her DNA did not match. What's also curious is Linda began working for Lawrence Schiller, author of Perfect Murder, Perfect Town, after the murder. Interesting. She also testified before the grand jury, September 1999. Go through some more info here. So Ariana Pugh, here's another mind shock. So apparently Susan Bennett, uncovered this information which may or may not be true and uh, i've gone over susan bet bennett on uh, previous episodes but apparently ariana pugh the daughter of linda hoffman pugh and mervyn pugh who assisted in the housekeeping susan bennett turned in a tip to lou smith stating that she found ariana in explicit sexual pose on an internet porno site. On the internet, people were writing that Linda Pugh's husband, Mervyn, was a child abuser and her daughter was in child porno pics. Her fingerprints were taken by the Boulder Police Department and she, as she helped out occasionally with the Ramsey's cleaning. Various other internet posters have claimed that Jameson's claim 
is completely bogus. So uh, apparently the police would have that. Now, are the police involved? For those that believe in some kind of wide, grand conspiracy involving some like, satanic rituals and satanic abuse and such, if the Boulder police is compromised, then of course they would uh, basically shut down this kind of information. So there's not really any further information, so apparently that has not been verified. So depending on how trustworthy people find Jameson, and again, Jameson just happens to be from the town in North Carolina, where the tape was manufactured of all places, and not only that, based on the date of manufacture of the tape, it, would, it wouldn't have had time to go through all the warehouses and be put on a shelf, so possibly taken from a local employee. I mean, the coincidence stack here is just, I mean, come on, pew, pow. I mean, come on, people. The coincidence stack is just simply too high. This is just weird. And we're only getting started here with the mind shocks, so... Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty rough. Apparently, from a candy rose, it only states that Ariana gave fingerprints, not blood, hair, handwriting samples. So, yeah, it's unclear exactly how many samples were taken. But again, this is another individual who uh, found the Christmas trees in the wine cellar, so familiar with the, with the area. So let's talk Mervyn Pew. So apparently, a woman called Mer Mervyn Irwin the Molester and said he killed Jean Benet. Again, this is just... Uh, this is John Ramsey relaying information from Pam Pow. So this is, uh, let's keep this all straight. This is Patsy Ramsey's sister, Pam Pow, talking about Linda Hoffman Pugh. <laughs> is everybody keeping all of this straight here? Thanksgiving weekend, 1996, Linda Pugh's daughter, Tina, Son-in-law Mike and Mervyn helped take the Christmas trees out of the wine cellar and carried them upstairs. So the other strange thing about Mervyn Pugh listed here is he gave the cops three rolls of black tape, a white lined notepad that came from the Ramsey house. See, how many notepads were there? And just because the notepad was found there with like the practice note taking, how does anybody know that the notepad wasn't taken from the house, all of that practice was done, and then brought back? Again, I mean, we're just thinking critically here. I'm not saying it makes sense for anybody to do that. I'm saying that this is not verified information. Three felt-tip pens and two narrow ropes and a rope around a stick. Weird. So he randomly gave the cops this? So, Mervyn Pugh claimed he didn't know the Ramseys, but he did go there to help Linda get the trees out of the basement. And is that the only time he's alleging to have been there? So, he did give fingerprints also, and it is unclear here. So, the rest of the family, it's only verified here that Linda Hoffman Pugh gave all of these different samples, hair, blood, prints. With the rest of the family, it only lists prints here. But may, they, perhaps they, they, they did. So, Mervyn Pugh's alibi is that he was not in Boulder the night of the murder. He fell asleep on the couch in front of the TV. Also, the police did search the Pew House December 27th, 96, so pretty much immediately after. That's curious. That's curious. So Tina Hoffman also was a housekeeper who assisted the Ramsey House's wine cellar was full of trees, some still covered with decorations from 1995. Thanksgiving weekend 96, Linda Pugh's daughter Tina, son-in-law Mike, and Mervyn helped take the Christmas trees out of the wine cellar and take all the trees upstairs. Okay, Pugh's son-in-law Mike also assisted here. Okay, all gave prints. So, here's an interesting statement from her that doesn't make a lot of sense, though. I mean, this does not make a lot of sense. So this is August 5th, 98 interview. Jean Benet's America. KUSA Channel 9 Denver aired August 5th, 98. Interviewer here. Then another story appeared. The room where Jean Benet was found was so hidden that whoever murdered her knew the house. Even the mayor of Boulder said so. 
The mayor stated, by all reports, there were no visible signs of forced entry. I mean, again, there were pry bar marks on the one door. The body was found in a place where people are saying somebody had to know the house. Interviewer states, television hammered the message home and shows the American Journal saying Jamini's body was found in a hidden room, using the word hidden. Linda Hoffman, the housekeeper, stated, when I cleaned that house, I cleaned that basement many times and didn't even know that that room was there. It tells me somebody had to know the house. So Linda Hoffman Pugh, who cleans the house countless times, does not even know about this room. I mean, come on, does, it, does anybody buy this? So as you can see on the map, I mean, this boiler room is right next to... Uh, is right next to the wine cellar where all the Christmas trees were. I mean, how is it possible? So the wine cellar is the storage room where Jean Benet's body is found. So this is the same room we're talking about here. So this is where the trees were. So you, you have to go through the boiler room here area to get there. So what does everybody makes make of this because this is where the christmas trees were where her and her whole family took christmas trees from this hidden room let me repeat the quote again when i cleaned that house i cleaned that basement many times and i didn't even know that room was there it tells me somebody had to know the house so the room from which she physically took christmas trees out of she didn't know that room was there okay so February 18th, 99, Perfect Murder, Perfect Town, page 198 to 202, The Linda Hoffman Pew Story. I was born in Lyons, Kansas, and my dad was a poor wheat farmer. I had three brothers and one sister. I'm the youngest, and one of my brothers is 23 years older than me. He's a welder with his own construction business in Fort Morgan, Colorado. When I was 13, we moved to Fort Morgan because my dad wasn't doing well. We went to work for my brother as a ditch digger. My dad was an alcoholic. He died in 1986. My mother was 41 when she had me. I have six living kids, 10 grandchildren, and a paper route. I have my ladies, the woman I work for. I have a doctor's wife in Greeley and a lawyer. I was working for a bonded agency called Merry Maids when I met Patsy. I started with her one day a week. I was dumbfounded the place was so huge. It was too much for one person. Soon we had four people once a week. Patsy was warm and kind, just a sweet person, but she had a hard time keeping up the laundry. She was doing lots of charity work and was involved with her schools, with her children's schooling. Then I went to work for her three days a week, 72 a day, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I got there at 9 in the morning and be gone by 3. That's when my daughter Ariana gets out of school. Sometimes I work for Patsy on Saturdays and holidays. She gave me a $300 bonus at the end of my first year. That was October 27, 1996. Patsy was afraid she wasn't going to live and that her cancer would come back and she never lived to see the children grow up. She read a lot about illness and healing. Every three months she had a checkup. She believed if she prayed, everything would be all right. Patsy admired John. He had accomplished a lot. She told me that when they started out, they had nothing and they worked themselves up to where they were now. I first met John Bonet when she was in preschool. She was home like half a day. Patsy called her Johnny B. I spent half my time picking up after her. She and her brother would just leave everything on the floor. Their socks, their shoes, toys, books, just everything. They were never trained to put things away properly. I always came in the side door and I'd walk right into the kitchen and not know where to start. Dishes all over. If they had Ovaltine, whatever happened to the popularity of Ovaltine? That, that used to be quite popular. The jar would still be open. I always had to wipe the peanut butter off the counter. I think we ought to get a hamper, I told Patsy. Yeah, that sounds good, she answered, but we never got one. They don't have a hamper? Linda is not here to pick up, Patsy's mother would say. She's here to clean. How do you expect her to do a good job if she's picking up? Okay, Mom, I'll work it out. So I'm guessing she's recalling a conversation between Patsy and her own mother. Patsy's clothes went into the laundry chute. I never had to pick up after John. Maybe once a pair of shoes. Patsy changed purses once a week. She'd lay her purse on the spiral staircase and I'd clean it out and put it in the closet. She had maybe 40 of them and even more pairs of shoes. I think the problem with the children was they didn't have any responsibility. They were spoiled. Burke had this red scout knife and always whittled. 
He'd never use a bag or paper to catch the shavings. He'd whittle all over the place. I asked Patsy to have a talk with him. She answered, quote, well, I don't know what to do other than take the knife away from him, end quote. After Thanksgiving, I took the, that knife away from him and hid it in the cupboard just outside JonBenet's room. That's how that problem was solved. These were not, weren't naughty children. They dressed themselves, and Patsy did JonBenet's hair. All her daughter's clothes were organized in drawers, turtlenecks in one drawer, pants in another, nighties and panties in one, socks in another. Dates on all their underclothes. Just go away and leave me alone, JonBenet said when I tried to help her with her boots. Sometimes she acted like a spoiled brat. No, don't you answer the door, she'd say, when someone went to open it at a lunchy on Patsy Gabe. I'm answering the door. JonBenet spent a lot of her time sitting on her bed watching Shirley Temple movies on her VCR. She loved them all. She also loved being in pageants. If she didn't want to go, Patsy didn't make her. Interesting statements from uh, Linda Hoffman Pugh here regarding the dynamic. So she's stating that Patsy did not force Jean Benet to go to the pageant. Interesting. Nedra used to bring lots of things for Jean Benet to wear. Nedra did most of the pageant planning. Another interesting point. So it was Patsy's mother, Nedra, who did all of this planning. Jean Benet would have to practice singing and dancing. Nedra and Patsy's sister, Pam, would decorate JonBenet's shoes, her gloves, put sequins in her hats. Some dresses were made from scratch, but they had fun altering most things. They prepared differently for each pageant. Sometimes it would take a month. They were always reworking something. JonBenet played a lot with Daphne, the white's little girl. They were real close. And Burke had his friends, the Walker and Stein children. We've gone over the Steins quite a few times, and the Whites, which we'll, we will continue to do so. When the Ramses traveled, I started taking the children's dog, Jacques, home with me. It would always yip, 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 and I couldn't take it. Joe Barnhill, the elderly neighbor from across the street, started watching Jacques, and they got attached to each other. Before long, the dog was always running across the street to the Barnhill's house. Jacques started staying over there, and when Jean Benet wanted to see her dog, she went over and played with him. In the summer of 96, Jean Benet started wearing those diaper-type underpants pull-ups. She even wore them to bed. There was always a wet one in the trash. By the end of the summer, Patsy was trying to get her to do without them. Then Jean Benet started wetting the bed again. Almost every day I was there, there was a wet bed. Patsy said she wasn't going to use pull-ups again. She just put a plastic cover on the bed. No big deal to her. By the time I'd come in the morning, Patsy would have all the sheets off the bed and in the laundry. Jean Benet's white blanket would already be in the dryer. The Ramseys had two washer dryers, one in the basement, and a stackable unit in a closet just outside Jean Benet's room. I mean, you know, you know you have a big house when you have two sets of washers and dryers. Patsy started taking a painting class, and Jean Benet drew a lot, of, a lot with crayons and markers, people and flowers. They had a big easel, but most of the time Jean Benet painted on a card table in the butler's kitchen. Patsy had her paints and brushes in a white paint tote. Sometimes she asked me to take her paints down to the basement. I don't want to see it. Interesting. On the day of the Ramsey's Christmas party, I took the paint tote downstairs. Evenings were for the family. They did homework and had dinner together. Patsy worked on school projects with the kids. She was always doing something for the children on her computer. She read to them at bedtime. Sometimes she asked me to babysit if she couldn't find a sitter. Patsy spent a lot of time alone in the house while John was away on business. She never kept a baseball bat under the bed or mace. Never even set the alarm. Let me repeat that again. Never even set the alarm. She didn't like it because it went off accidentally and it drove the police crazy. The last month I was there, nothing was different. Patsy went to New York with her family and some friends. Jean Benet even ice skated at Rockefeller Center. When they came back, they got ready for another pageant. Patsy was always putting things off until last minute. On December 23rd, Jean Benet was playing with makeup. Jean Benet, you are not going anywhere with all that on, Patsy told her. You, t you take some of it off, Jean Benet did. At 1 o'clock, she went to play with some friends and was back by 4 o'clock. Late that afternoon, she didn't want to wear a dress for the Christmas party. Patsy got a little agitated. Finally, Jean Benet put on a velvet one with short sleeves. I stuck around with my daughter Ariana to see Santa. 
We hadn't planned to stay, so Ariana wasn't dressed up. Patsy gave my daughter a Christmas sweater and a vest. Even lent her a pair of shoes. At the last minute, Patsy wrote a little verse about Ariana for Santa to read. Well, that's nice of her. Patsy Ramsey wrote a little verse about Ariana for Santa to read. So if they're not all involved with some kind of satanic child abuse, I mean, that's a very nice uh, gesture for the housekeeper's daughter. I mean, how many rich people would actually do that? I don't know. At 5.30 p.m., Santa showed up. By then, the Barnhills, the Fernies, the Steins, Pinky Barber, and the Whites, who came with Priscilla's parents, Priscilla White's parents, had all arrived, maybe eight couples and their children. Most of the men gathered by the spiral staircase. John made drinks for everybody from the butler's kitchen. The kids played in the living room by the big Christmas tree. That's where Santa read his little verses about everyone. This year, Mrs. Claus was there, too. Santa looked kind of sick. I was supposed to come back the next day, December 24th, and clean up. I called Patsy and said I couldn't. I told her I had a fight with my sister and needed some money to pay the rent. Okay, so she's admitting this. I asked Patsy for a $2,000 loan. I told her I would pay it back $50 each week. She didn't hesitate. Sure, she said she'd leave it to me on the kitchen counter for my next regular visit on December 27th. The more I think about it, Jean Benet could not have been killed by a stranger. I didn't even know that room was there. How could a stranger know to go there? How in the world did this happen? So the room that she retrieved the Christmas trees from with her family. So keep in mind, the lawsuit was for the Ramsey's book, Death of Innocence. These are statements that I just went over from Perfect Murder, Perfect Town by Schiller, which apparently she, had, she admitted all of these things. So it's a $2,000 loan, not a $2,500 loan. So... It doesn't say that the sister would have kicked her out if she didn't pay, simply that there was a fight and she needed to pay the rent, not that there was any threat of a kick out, just that the rent needed to be paid. So that seems like a really minor quibble. I mean, this is a little weird. Also, what does everybody make about Linda Hoffman Pugh denying the existence of that, that she knew about the room? So let's look at this excerpt from Rolling Stone magazine revolving different suspects here. Patsy claimed to investigators that Hoffman Pugh was struggling for money and had asked for a loan of several thousand dollars, which Ramsey had declined. So, so Linda is claiming that Patsy was nice and didn't decline the loan. Is that to cover herself by removing that motive there? Police showed up at the Pew's home the night after the murder, asked for the 57-year-old housekeeper to write the number $180,000 on a piece of paper, and reportedly took her fingerprints and several strands of her hair. She then testified in front of a grand jury for a total of eight hours, including a statement against Patsy that read, I think she had multiple personalities. She'd be in a good mood, and then she'd be cranky. She got into arguments with Jean Monnet about wearing a dress or about a friend coming over. I had never seen Patsy so upset. So she's, I mean, she's really pointing the finger at Patsy here because she said she's never seen Patsy so upset as the night of that Christmas party. Was it that party or the, the one two, out, two days prior? The Hoffman Pew theory asserted that the housekeeper led a trusting Jean Benet down into the basement that night in an attempt to trick her employers into leaving money for her ransom. It's possible she could have seen John, John Ramsey's pay stub for $180,000 as a holiday bonus and chosen that as her demand. Familiar with both the home and the family's schedule, Hoffman Pugh makes a convenient suspect and without an alibi. She was asleep in bed while her husband allegedly slept on the couch. There is room to speculate she could have been involved. Okay, so let's go to uh, the Jean, let's go to all the evidence here. This is on the JonBenet Ramsey case encyclopedia, JonBenetRamsey.pbworks.com. The Linda Hoffman Pugh theory. The incriminating evidence against Linda Hoffman Pugh. Linda Hoffman Pugh had the motive. Patsy had denied her re recent request for a loan of several thousand dollars. I mean, do we have corroboration from other people here? Because is it basically just Patsy's word against hers? Because then how do we know what the real truth is? So the means, a key to the house, or two, knew the house, knew Jean Monnet Ramsey. Yes, true. Opportunity, she likely knew their schedule on Christmas night as well as their travel plans for December 26th to kill Jean Monnet Ramsey. No alibi. 
investigated by the Boulder PD. So, again, the Boulder PD showed up at the Pew's house, or police showed up, unclear which department, but police showed up and searched their home the day after. So, the author of... Sweet, the author of Sweetie B, Little Girl Blue, the Jean, Jean Benet Inside Circle Theory, and internet poster Braveheart summarized the case against Linda. One, the pews had black duct tape, white nylon cording. Well, then again, so do a lot of people. Two, they had recently been in the windowless room. I mean, that's, that's kind of damning because of the trees they had to take out of that room. And then Linda's claiming she never even knew the room existed. Although, even if she's innocent, she might still claim that just to, to kind of make sure the finger's not pointed at her, right? They knew of the broken window. They had a key to the house. They had access to John's payroll stubs, although supposedly anybody wandering around the night of the party would have seen it. They needed money. They knew the Ramseys were going to Charlevoix. She thought the Subic Bay photo said Subic Bay Training Center. Interesting. She volunteered the meaningful information that Jean Benet had an ongoing wet bedding, uh, bedwetting problem. She knew where the knife was hidden. She knew where Patsy kept her paint tote. She thought the terms fat cat and southern common sense were used by the family. If she had heard them throw those terms around and she was trying to implicate them to make it look like they wrote a bogus ra uh, ransom note to cover for something for themselves, I mean, yeah, I mean, the theory kind of sort of works. Possibly an ignorant person might believe they could extort $118,000 from someone without getting caught, especially if they could convince that someone not to call the authorities. The Pews watched a lot of television. Oh, so do a lot of people. They were home together the night of the murder. That's eh, so weird a lot of people. Okay, so I mean, yeah, I mean, the, the, there's circumstantial evidence here, no doubt, but there's so far, there's nothing really damning here. Internet poster Deb has provided the following evidence that points towards Linda. A suspicious comment, she stated, aren't you afraid she might get kidnapped? Again, I don't consider that that suspicious. The apparent lie about the wine cellar stated she didn't know the cellar was there, even though they removed the trees from there. That's a big one. I mean, that might be one of the big, that's one of the biggest ones there. She had access to the paper used for the ransom note, so could have written it any time. She knew the back stairs were primarily used. She knew the dog was gone. If caught in the house, she could have an excuse, wanted to drop off a gift before they left in the morning, left something behind, looking for the check, etc. Told mixed stories, no alibi. Per Pam, she would say weird things. She would have been able to get Jean Benet downstairs because Jean Benet trusted her and or her husband could have been the person who told Jean Benet about Santa coming after Christmas. She would have felt comfortable offering Jean Benet Ramsey pineapple. Deb also offered additional reasons for suspecting Linda Hoffman Pugh. She was supposed to work that day, but backed out. I mean, that is a curiosity. Anytime somebody's schedule or something is out of the ordinary, so she did not work that day. She lied about why the money was needed. I mean, do we know that for sure? Where did that information come from? She lied about Mrs. Ramsey drawing pictures on Johnny B's hand. Came up with the Barbie nightgown being stuck to the blanket, which she said must have been in the dryer. What made her think that? Had a key, had access to everything. Knew the family very well. All their little sayings, like Southern Common Sense, was around the grandfather who used fat cats. Knew the dog was gone. Needed money. Knew they would be using the back staircase, and which was commonly used to leave Patsy's purses to be cleaned for her. She and her husband only had each other's alibis, and they did not sleep in the same room. So that's not even 100% verifiable alibi. <laughs> her husband is or was an alcoholic by his appearance. Her daughter might fit the underwear. What? She would know how soundly the Ramseys slept and that they could not hear much on the third floor. She would feel safe if caught in the house, could say she was looking for the check or left something there that she needed. Joan, uh, Johnny B would feel safe going downstairs with her. She stated, aren't you afraid she might be kidnapped? She knew where she hid the red knife. Lied about not knowing about the cellar room. They removed the trees from there. $118,000 would seem like a lot of money to them, which she would have seen on his paycheck stub. 
Also, if she really, I mean, this it's kind of hard to really dissect the mentality of criminals looking to extort, especially if they're known to the family. Because if she really did maybe care or like the Ramseys to a certain extent, she might think just taking the bonus isn't that bad. Like, if her bonus was 300 bucks or whatever, it's not like that's her main paycheck. So it's like she probably thought they could survive without the bonus. She didn't want to take them for all that they were worth, but just the bonus because the bonus would be life-changing for them or whoever. If, if there was an intruder and if this really was some kind of botched kidnapping, that could have been their line of thought. She changed her story about Patsy being warm and kind to Patsy having a split personality, sweet then angry. The ransom note was first made out to Mr. and Mrs. R., she liked Patsy. She probably thought John was aloof. She changed her story so much as if to cover for someone. She came up with the idea of Subic Bay Training Center from a picture that hung in the Ramsey's house when it actually just said Subic Bay. She knew they were leaving town, and if they needed more money, now was the time to do it. So exculpatory evidence here. The DNA does not match. So the DNA found at the crime scene is reportedly of a male. Now, again, first of all, this is old DNA technology. As I've stated in the last few episodes, the latest generation DNA technology has not been used to test the sample that they have. And supposedly there's only enough of the sample to do one more test. So they could either do it now or they could wait for the next another generation of technology to come along. So also, if Linda's not acting alone, that doesn't specifically exculpate her, but... Continuing on here, she's not a suspect by police or the Ramseys. I, I'm, I'm assuming this is currently. The 11th Circuit, however, affirmed the court's, the district court's decision that the defendants, John and Patsy Ramsey's book, when considered as a whole, does not defame Mrs. Pa Hoffman Pugh as a matter of law. The court concluded that the book, when fairly read, did not convey that Miss Hoffman Pugh was a suspect in the murder. I mean, they named a lot of suspects, so... I mean, that's from Carnes, 2003. Key to the 11th Circuit's analysis is the defendant's failure to ever state that Ms. Hoffman Pugh, defendant's housekeeper, was considered to be a murder suspect by them or the police. I mean, that's not entirely true. They named a lot of plausible suspects, but or hypothetical suspects. And apparently Hoffman Pugh was never formally accused of the crime, although that doesn't really mean much. Okay, the Ramseys vouch for her character. Before they knew their daughter's fate, at a time when they believed her to have been kidnapped and were running through their minds the people who knew Jean Bonnet, the defendants never believed that Miss Hoffman Pugh would hurt their daughter even if she had kidnapped her because she was a good, sweet person. Although, again, if it's a kidnapping gone wrong, does not fit the profile. Okay, so the profile is a male age 25 to 35, former convict or has been around hardened criminals who had access to a stun gun. Again, I mean... What can you make of that? An interesting uh, footnote here is to chance to lie averted. If Linda or Mervyn were guilty, one would expect them to have provided an alibi for one another. Instead, they pointedly indicated that they had slept in different rooms. I mean, I don't know what to make of that either because I, that, that, that doesn't really prove anything one way or another. Also, if they possibly came up with a kidnapping scheme and brought in other hardened criminals that squeezed them out of the plan, I mean... That's not exactly 100% innocence there. Let's go through some more articles here. This is uh, February 15th. It's no year here. Book offers insight into Patsy. Denver Post staff and Wire reports. So I'm, I'm assuming this is somewhere around 2000, but it doesn't actually list here. This is Denver Post. February 15th, when police detective Tom Haney told Patsy Ramsey during a June 98 interview that she had lied to him, Mrs. Ramsey replied, Pal, you don't want to go there. Don't start that. Author Lawrence Schiller writes in his book on John Bonet's lying. The excerpts were released Sunday by Newsweek. The tougher the questions became, the tougher Patsy became, as Schiller stated. Still, it was almost impossible to believe that she'd gone from being a normal mother, which until then she had given every indication of being, to being a murderer that night. Haney had never been able to come up with a motive for the killing, and now, after three days of questioning, he had not been able to find a trigger that might have set Patsy off if she was the killer, Schiller wrote. The author also theorized JonBenet's killer was familiar with the house and knew where the family kept the blanket in which her body 
in which her body was wrapped. Suzanne Lorian, a spokeswoman with the Boulder DA's office, said the DA won't comment on this book or any of the parade of books or television programs featuring the crime that continues to captivate the country. Our office is a long-standing policy of not responding to stories about the Ramsey case, Lorian said. This includes newspaper and magazine articles, television programs, and books. We intend to adhere to this policy throughout the promotion and sale of Lawrence Schiller's book. Attorney Hal Haddon, who represents John Bonet's parents, John and Patsy Ramsey, declined to comment Sunday because he had not had a chance to read the book, Perfect Murder, Perfect Town, which will be released later this week. In the book, Schiller examines several facets of the crime, including differences between police and prosecutors, tabloid speculation, and the culture of Boulder. I think there will be a resolution to the case, Schiller said. I think all the evidence will come out, but that doesn't mean someone will be convicted. Schiller assisted O.J. Simpson on his book, I Want to Tell You, and co-wrote American Tragedy, the uncensored story of the Simpson defense. He also worked with Norman Mailer on his Pulitzer Prize winning The Executioner's Song. Jean Benet, a six-year-old beauty queen, was found beaten and strangled in her family's Boulder home December 26, 1996, about eight hours after Mrs. Ramsey reported finding a ransom note demanding $118,000 for Jean Benet's safe return. Police have said the Ramseys remain under suspicion in her death, while the Ramseys have repeatedly maintained their innocence. A Boulder County grand jury had been reviewing evidence in the case since September. In the book, Schiller said Mrs. Ramsey was polite and charming during the first two days of the June interview with Haney and an attorney working on the case. On the third day, Mrs. Ramsey became tough. At one point, she raised her hand across the table in front of Haney's face and said, you're going down the wrong road, Schiller said. Case detectives believes Haney reached the real Patsy. She had exhibited the hard side of her persona, a side capable of bringing harm to her daughter, Schiller wrote. I mean, isn't this all kind of presumptuous though? Like. Any parent being accused of lying or possibly being guilty in some way of the death of their child, if they're not, would react, I mean, wouldn't they react quite defensively? I mean, I'm just speculating here, but I mean, it, it doesn't seem strange to have them react that way. If they're guilty, they could react that way. Also, again, that's a, you know, false dichotomy here. He also detailed police interviews with the Ramsey's former housekeeper, Linda Hoffman Pugh, who told them Jean Benet's body was wrapped in a blanket that was either on her bed or in a washer dryer unit in a cabinet outside the girl's room. Only someone who knew which washer and dryer the Ramsey's used for Jean Benet's sheets and blankets would know where to find the blanket if it wasn't on the bed. Schiller wrote. That's an interesting point. How does so Hoffman Pugh really does know all this information other people can't know. Like what does that mean exactly? What does that mean? Let's continue on here to another article here. ABC News, Denver, July 5th, 2001. A federal judge Ramsey housekeeper can talk. A federal judge today ruled that a former housekeeper for the parents of the slain child beauty queen Jamine Ramsey can reveal what she told a secret grand jury two years ago. No indictments were ever issued in the Boulder, Colorado grand jury proceedings that ended in 1999, and neither was any report ever issued, meaning under Colorado rules that grand jury witnesses had to keep their testimony secret indefinitely. Linda Hoffman Pugh, who wants to write a book about her experience working for John and Patsy Ramsey when they lived in Colorado, sued Boulder's current DA, Mary Keenan, arguing the state's strict secrecy rule for grand juries was unconstitutional. U.S. District Judge Wiley Daniel agreed, ruling that Hoffman Pugh could repeat what she testified before the grand jury in 1999. The judge said the rules were invalid to the extent that they prohibited grand jury witnesses from disclosing their own testimony after a grand jury has completed its work. Daniel's decision opens the door for about, uh, about 100 other grand jury witnesses to speak about their testimony. Suspicion about a Swiss Army knife. Hoffman Pugh has been talking with the media about her opinions on the case. The difference is that now when she describes things she believes about the case, she can also say she said the same thing in front of the grand jury. But she may not disclose what questions she was asked or describe any reactions she may have seen from grand jurors. Her New York attorney, Darnay, Darnay Hoffman, told reporters after today's hearing. Darnay Hoffman? 
Is that a relative? Linda Hoffman Pugh. The Ramseys were not a party to the case, but their attorney, Lynn Wood, said he agreed with the judge's decision. Our preference would be for the public to know the complete truth, he said by telephone from Atlanta, where the Ramseys now live. The former housekeeper can, for instance, relate how she told the grand jury that she had hid a Swiss army knife that was found near Jean Benet's body and that she believes only Patsy Ramsey would have known where the knife was. Okay, so this is the knife that uh, Burke Ramsey whittled with and there were wood, wood shavings all over the place from the whittling and supposedly, according to the testimony here, was it... It was Linda Hoffman Pugh who said she took away the knife and put it in the, uh, in the cupboard. Let's, I'm going to get back to that point in a second, but let's uh, finish the article here. Former Ramsey supporter, the relationship between Hoffman Pugh and the Ramseys deteriorated after the child's body was discovered in the family's home in December 1996. Initially, the housekeeper supported the parents, but later turned against them, presumably because Patsy Ramsey told the police the housekeeper had asked her for money just before Christmas. Was that really true, though? Because she admitted to a certain extent in the other book. She just didn't tell him what the money was for. So she was mad about the disclosure of the asking for money. That, that's weird. Hoffman Pugh has sued the Ramseys for references they made about her in a book they've written on the case. Ramsey attorney Wood said today he will be asking a judge to dismiss the case. Still under an umbrella. When John Bonet first disappeared, it was believed she had been kidnapped for ransom after Patsy Ramsey said she found a note in the house asking for $118,000 for the safe return of the girl. No arrests have been made in the case, although police have said the parents remain under an umbrella of suspicion. The Ramseys have steadfastly maintained their innocence and have criticized police for what they characterized as botching the case. Under U.S. federal rules and the rules of at least 35 states, witnesses are free to discuss their testimony, but Colorado continues to follow the centuries-long rule of strict grand jury secrecy. Okay, let's go back to the knife situation. So this might be the most damning article of all regarding the knife situation. This is Associated Press, August 3rd, 1999. Ramsey housekeeper doubts intruder theory. Pocket knife hidden in the cupboard found near Jean Bonnet's body. A former housekeeper for Jean Bonnet Ramsey's parents believes the location of a pocket knife found by police casts doubt on the theory that the girl was killed by an intruder. And I mean, is this the biggest smoking gun in the Jean Bonnet Ramsey case thus far? I mean, I, I don't know. I think it might be. Let's 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 go over this. A knife that Linda Hoffman Pugh kept hidden in a cupboard, so it was her. So there's no evidence that anyone else knew where this knife was other than Linda Hoffman Pugh by her own word, which doesn't make any sense unless she's looking to implicate Patsy Ramsey, although perhaps Linda Hoffman Pugh didn't think this far enough ahead because... She's admitting that she was the one that put it there, and there's no evidence that she told Patsy about it. But let's let's read the article here. A knife that Linda Hoffman Pugh kept hidden in a cupboard on the second level of the home was found by police in the basement where Jean Benet's body was discovered. But Hoffman Pugh does not believe an intruder could have found it in the cupboard and left it downstairs. That knife showed up where Jean Benet was, she said. Quote, I would stake my life that an intruder wouldn't know to get that out of the cupboard. Someone took that knife out of the cupboard where I put it. End quote. So is that interesting phrasing? Would you stake your life on something if you, knew, if you didn't know that that statement was true? If Linda was the one that took the knife out of the cupboard... She would, of course, stake her life on it because she knows she's the one that took it out. Unless, again, that's just a common phrase. If she says she's going to stake her life on everything, and if that's a common phrase for her, and she always says that about everything, then that's not an unusual statement. But if she never says, I would stake my life, then that's, that's a lot more damning. One detective who worked on the case and was familiar with Hoffman Pugh's theory said it has merit. I think it's a legitimate area of concern that she has pointed out, the unnamed detective told the Denver Rocky Mountain News. Hoffman Pugh said she does not know who killed Jean Benet Six, whose body was found in the basement of the family's home December 26, 1996. 
Hoffman Pugh said JonBenet's brother, Burke, who was nine when his sister was killed, used to wander around the house whittling with his Swiss Army knife and leave wood shavings behind. She said she threatened to take the knife away unless he cleaned up his act. He didn't, and about a month before the JonBenet slaying, she took away the knife and put it in a cupboard over a sink near JonBenet's room. Is it possible Burke could have found that knife eventually after a month of looking? I mean, I don't know. How tall? I mean, yeah, I don't know. Hoffman Pugh said she did not tell Jean Monnet's parents where she put the knife. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. So she didn't tell them where... She, so she is she basically just admitting here that she's the only one who knew where that knife was and the knife ends up next to her next to Jean Monnet's dead body. Does anybody find this weird? A list of items removed from the house after a 10-day police search included a red pocket knife that was found by a detective on a countertop down a corridor from the small room where Jean Bonnet's body was found. So it wasn't right next to the body. Huh, that's curious. Countertop down a corridor from the small room. Okay, well, well perhaps this... That's tough. Huh. Police have not disclosed whether they believe the pocket knife was used in the crime. However, the lengths of nylon cord used in the garret and those found around the girl's wrists would have been cut into sections with a sharp instrument. But if they don't have any proof that the pocket knife was used to cut those specific ones, I don't know what to make of this. There have been no arrests in JonBenet's slang, which is being investigated by Boulder County Grand Jury. John and Patsy Ramsey remain under suspicion, but their son, Burke, now 12, has been cleared. This is August 3rd, 1999. So if there's no... If, if Okay, so the pocket knife was found down a corridor, so not right next to the body. And if they have not disclosed... Exactly. If they have not disclosed exactly whether or not they can prove the knife was involved then perhaps it's not the smoking gun here. Rents.com ex-housekeeper says Patsy Ramsey killed John Bonet by Mike McPhee, Denver Post staff writer. This is July 6, 2001, Denver Post. Federal judge Thursday gave grand jury witnesses permission to talk about their secret testimony, prompting the Ramsey family's former housekeeper to declare that Patsy Ramsey killed her six-year-old daughter. I mean, that's interesting. If, if, if Pew is actually innocent, I mean, the timeline kind of does add up that all of a sudden she's allowed to talk, so now she can reveal what she testified. That's that's not quite that shady. I don't know. Former Ramsey housekeeper Linda Hoffman Pew, speaking publicly for the first time about her testimony before the Boulder County Grand Jury, told reporters Thursday she thought Patsy Ramsey had killed John Bonet. The grand jury seemed to zero in on Patsy Ramsey, and she thought it would indict her. A Swiss Army knife was found in the basement room where John Bonet's body was found. And again, I'm assuming they verified this was the same Swiss Army knife. Only Patsy could have put the knife there. I took it away from Burke, JonBenet's older brother, and hid it in a linen closet near JonBenet's bedroom. An intruder would have never found it. Patsy would have found it getting out clean sheets. Okay, well, that's actually a plausible explanation. I thought she had meant she hid it in some spot where nobody could find it, but if she just put it right next to the clean sheets, theoretically, anybody could have found it. Because if an intruder is looking for a place to hide, they're going to check some closets, aren't they? They open a closet, they might see a knife there, they might take it. So again, now, now going over this new information here, it would seem this is not a smoking gun in any way. Pieces of rope were tied around JonBenet's neck and wrists when her body was discovered, December 26, 1996. The blanket wrapped around JonBenet's body had been left in the dryer. There was still a Barbie doll nightgown clinging to the blanket, so it would have had to have come out of the dryer recently, she said. Only Patsy would have known it was in the dryer, she said. And that, that's, yeah, that's curious. An intruder would have never found the door to the basement room where Jean Bonnet's body was discovered. It was too difficult to see unless someone knew it was there, she said. Hoffman Pugh has never turned off her porch light since the death of Jean Bonnet and won't until her killer is found. She believes Governor Bill Owens should appoint a special prosecutor to the case. The rest of the post here is just other people who think Patsy did it. Okay. So interesting information there. So let's move on to Mervyn Pugh, Linda's husband here. So he worked. So this is kind of weird because 
from all this information here, he did work for the Ramses as a handyman, but he said he didn't know them. Does that mean he knew their house and he worked there, but they were never there when he was there? Is that what that means? Or did he deny ever working there other than moving the trees the one time? So apparently he had been expected to fix the broken window in the storage room. So I don't, that was an expectation. It's unclear how much of an expectation this was or if there was like a formal offer for him to do so. Jameson also stated that uh, after reviewing investigator notes, she found that he worked in the Ramsey house around Thanksgiving 96. He worked on tiles in Patsy's bathroom and on the cabinet doors in the kids' playroom on the second floor. And he never got to the broken window in the basement. Also, Tina was with him part of the time he was there. Later, Linda and her family removed Christmas trees and other decorations from the basement, some from the windowless room. And that, of course, exposes Linda's claim that she didn't know the room was there. So make of that what you will. A couple more interesting points on Merv from various sources here. Boulder Police Reports, Perfect Murder, Perfect Town, Thomas's book. Mervyn Pugh, the husband, was visibly intoxicated when he was interviewed, and the detectives knew he had a few brushes with the law back in Michigan. So this guy also happens to be from Michigan? I mean, there's three states in question here. There's Colorado, Michigan, and Georgia, where Atlanta is. And it seems like a lot of these people just circulate amongst these three states of all states. Is she missing or dead, he asked. How did she die? Was it natural strangulation or what? The questions were awfully close to the truth, close enough to raise police suspicion. That is kind of random. I mean, would you ask if uh, a six-year-old had a natural... And what does he mean by natural? Is that supposed to be like accidental, like in a non-murder situation? Because obviously, I mean, unless she had some kind of illness, it wouldn't be a natural cause... It would be some kind of accidental cause. Or strangulate, strangulation, or what? Huh. A blunt-spoken man in his 50s, Pew had been in the Ramsey home a few times to help his wife, including a recent weekend when they spent three hours hauling Christmas decorations up from the basement. That's from Thomas's book. From Perfect Murder, Perfect Town. Hoffman Pew was then asked to make a list of everyone she knew who frequented the house and a list of those who had keys. After two hours of intense questioning, she was so upset that for a moment she couldn't find her own key. Months later, the police asked her about scuff marks they found on the wall below the broken basement window near John Andrew's suitcase. Maybe someone had climbed in that night and left the marks. Had she ever seen the marks? No, she told them. So apparently those marks were brand new. Interesting. We didn't have that piece of information before. Very curious. When detective, so this is now back to uh, Thomas's book. When detectives asked the parents who might be responsible for the disappearance of Jean Bonnet, Patsy promptly gave them the name of her housekeeper for the past two years, Linda Hoffman Pugh, who had recently asked for a $2,000 loan. The handwriting in the ransom note, the mother said, also looked a little like the housekeeper's. The Reverend Raul Haverstock told police about a phone call made that morning to Patsy's parents, Nedra and Don Powell, in Atlanta. Mrs. Powell, he said, mentioned that Linda Hoffman Pugh had commented about how beautiful Jean Bonnet was and expressed the fear that someone might kidnap her. The housekeeper's name had come up several times in a short period and police had already been told she had a key. She became the first suspect and police made plans to contact her immediately. In the weeks that following the murder, housekeeper Linda Hoffman Pugh was riding around in a limousine paid for by the tabloids. Again, I mean, innocent or guilty, I mean... Actually, I would th that'd probably be more likely that she was innocent if she would accept that. I mean, I don't know, again. Linda Hoffman Pugh's husband, Mervyn, worked sometimes as a handyman for the Ramsey, so while he was not at the house as frequently as his wife, he certainly had access and keys to it and could have become familiar with the basement area in particular. He had been expected to fix the broken window in the storage room next to the train room, but it's not clear whether he was asked or completed the work, whether he was ever asked or completed the work. From Boulder Police Report 5-29, the housekeeper's husband supposedly washed the windows at Thanksgiving time and supposedly went in the basement and washed the basement windows. 
Why would he say he doesn't know the Ramseys? I guess if he means he doesn't know them personally, if all this work, because he wasn't there a million times, it was however many days, a couple days, if the Ramseys weren't there at the time that he was there, I mean, I guess that could make sense. From Tom, uh, this is from Woodward. Patsy told that detective about her housekeeper, her housekeeper's family, and how the housekeeper had recently asked to borrow $2,000. Arndt also wrote that Patsy's mother, by phone from Atlanta, had said she wanted Detective Arndt to know the housekeeper had told her many times that Jean Bonnet was such a beautiful girl and asked if she, Jean Bonnet Ramsey's grandmother, wasn't afraid someone was going to kidnap her granddaughter. So this is from Woodward. Um, okay, so if it was many times, that is suspicious. If he's, she's constantly going on and on about her getting kidnapped, I mean, that's kind of suspicious. If it was only one or two times over a period of two years, that's probably less suspicious. Okay, back to Thomas. When the detectives asked if the couple had any black tape, Mervyn dug three rolls from his garage, only one unused. Then the detectives said they wanted white-lined notepads, and Linda handed over one that seemed to be a visual match of the ransom note paper and admitted it had come from the Ramsey house. So hold on a second. Hold on a second here. So why are they just handing over all this stuff that uh, implicates them? Isn't that kind of weird? Anybody else find that kind of weird? If they're guilty, why would they freely admit and give all of this? So they're, they're lifting. So they're steal Linda's stealing notepads from the Ramsey house and admitting it. Continuing on here from Thomas. A key, question mark, two. So they have two keys to the Ramsey home. Any felt tip pens of the sort that probably wrote the ransom note? Three. So they also have three felt tip pens that would match that of the ransom note. Police found a two-foot piece of narrow nylon rope and then another length wrapped around a stick. The detectives left with an armful of potential evidence. So again, this is from Thomas's book. So has it ever been revealed if the, if the nylon rope matches that which was used in the crime? Because if it, I mean, this is all crazy. Or is it, sim is it simply the same type of rope, but not the one used? Same thing with the with the with the tape, the three rolls of tape. Are they simply the exact same type of tape, but not specifically the tape used? Because why would they freely give all of this? So apparently the na the nylon rope they didn't freely give. The police found that on their own in the house and took it. But why would they hand over the ransom note paper that that they admit came from the Ramsey home? I mean, does anybody can anybody make sense of this? this is weird. So, Detective Steve Thomas was also asked this in an online chat room in the year 2000. Wow, that, that seems like such a long time ago now. It's 2022. It's kind of weird. So, tw roughly 22 years ago, Steve Thomas commented on the pews. This is his response. Hoffman Pew's immediate and even extended family were investigated. Again, absent a great conspiracy, I am not a conspiracy theorist, these simple people of simple means were not involved. Linda the maid loved Patsy like a sister. The husband, although some scrapes with the law, showed no evidence to suggest involvement, etc. Again, too long for this chat, the moderator reminds me. But Hoffman Pugh is not involved. So even though he wrote all of this circumstantial evidence about them, I mean, it kind of makes sense if they're that simple-minded and they really did just lift uh, note paper and pens and random stuff from the Ramsey home, they would admit it if they're that simple-minded and they know they didn't commit the crime. I mean, I don't know. I mean, this is all kind of weird. So Steve Thomas is basically saying they're way too simple-minded to have pulled this off. But here, so, so a couple, I have a rebuttal to this, because if someone is that simple-minded, I mean, let's, let's go to, uh, let's go to a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's, in King Arthur's court. So Mark Twain stated this, there are some things that can beat smartness and foresight, awkwardness and stupidity can. The best swordsman in the world doesn't need to fear the second best swordsman in the world. No, the person for him to be afraid of 
is some ignorant antagonist who has never had a sword in his hand before. He doesn't do the thing he ought to do, and so the expert isn't prepared for him. So, again, I'm not stating that some really dumb people committed this crime. I'm just stating that if criminals who had never committed a crime before, if there was a mix of some awkwardness and pure luck that they could have springboarded their stupidity off of, it's, po I mean, this case, again, is unsolved. It is as of yet unsolved. It has not been definitively solved beyond a reasonable doubt. So no one's debating that they're simple people, but, and here's the thing, if they did bring other criminal contractors in the loop and then they were actually pushed out of the loop, again, that doesn't mean they're 100% innocent. There, there's further degrees of crime here, even if they didn't, physically commit the crime themselves. They could have provided insider information. Regardless of how much of simpletons they are, they could have still provided insider information. Also, furthermore, Mervyn still has that Michigan connection and it's a criminal track record and his statement, how did she die? Was it natural strangulation or what? I mean, I don't know. It's, it's kind of hard to completely write them off. Here's an interesting post by Captain Kroger on Reddit regarding Steve Thomas. It shows what a bad detective Steve Thomas was. Pretty much all you have to do is appear cooperative, and he, he's convinced you have nothing to do with the crime. Which anyone who's followed true crime knows that is absolutely not true. Guilty people can be just as cooperative as innocent usually are. He says a lot in the book, so-and-so was cooperative, insinuating that person is innocent and that the Ramses must be guilty. I wouldn't be surprised at all if it ends up that he interviewed the intruder and didn't suspect a thing just because the person was cooperative and seemed nice. I really don't know why people are impressed with him. Even some intruder did it people and think his book is good. He's an idiot and his book is easily the worst written book on the case. An absolute chore to get through. But it did make me wonder just how many pens there were like the Sharpie that was used. Sounds like the Ramses brought, bought them in bulk. So how sure was the FBI that the pen used to write the ransom note was the exact one that was put back? I mean, that's actually a really good question. So apparently, from the Wolf vs. Ramsey deposition, Lynn Wood, Steve Thomas here, they stated here, regarding the exact pen, the Secret Service matched the ink from practice note to the ransom note. So they said it was the same pen for both notes, but here's the thing. Is the, is the ink really different from an identical manufactured pen? I mean, is the ink really different from pen to pen? Like a standard stock pen of whatever, Sharpie pens. Can the ink, I mean, I, th this is a question for any, for any pen connoisseurs out there who are really into pen forensics. Can it really be determined, like, if you have two identical model Sharpie pens manufactured within the same time period, can you really tell them apart where the ink came from? I'm not sure about that. Another interesting, uh, this is a post from Jameson245, unknown if this is the actual Jameson. Mervyn was described to me as a lazy drunk who would have been too lazy to go, to go to Boulder for this crime. He was a couch potato and not smart enough to have written the ransom note. Any item that came from the Ramsey house was not only accept accessible but almost expected like all housekeepers are thieves. Since the focus of the investigation done by the Boulder, P Boulder PD was to find evidence against the Ramseys, anything that could be considered exculpatory to the Ramseys was, well, as I see it, buried. I have no idea if the evidence taken from Mervyn and Linda's house was actually tested, but it needed to be. Major mistake there, as the people associated with the pews should have been listed, interviewed, and investigated. I have no reason to think that happened at all. No reason at all. Not a single source, not a single document indicates that happened at all. There is a theory that Linda would talk to the family and their friends about the rich families she worked for. I can absolutely believe that. She may have spoken about their family, their money, John's business, seeing a pay stub, and can you believe that bonus? Even if Mervyn was too drunk and lazy to have been JonBenet's killer, that doesn't mean 
the investigation should have ended there. Their circle of friends with access to the black duct tape owned by Mervyn and the inf information provided by Linda, well, one of them may be the man we need to talk to. That's a good point, too. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. Huh. Someone else hypothesized that if Mervyn Pugh really was some kind of pedophile or involved in other criminal rings, if he knew the real perpetrator, the real perpetrator might have told him that he strangled Jean Bonnet. Even if Mervyn is not directly connected to the crime, he could have heard it from criminal friends down through the grapevine. If he's a criminal, I am not alleging he is or he is not. This is mind shock where the only thing we know for sure is that we don't know anything for sure. But that's just more interesting information there regarding the pens and uh, all of these things. I mean, these are the details. The devil is in the details. Okay. Let's move to the Jean Benet, the Jean Benet subreddit. Interesting post here by Comic Alasimok. <laughs> Two years ago, the Pew Theory. I think Linda Hoffman Pew and her husband needed money and they decided it would be easy to kidnap Jean Benet for a short time and get a small amount of money that Linda knew that the family had readily available. She copied the note from a letter she had composed beforehand or went to the house while the family was out with her key. And then Mervyn and or other accomplices snatched Jean Benet and helped, kept her in the wine cellar and left the note out during the night. However, since they were amateurs, they didn't know how to contain her without having to hit her and accidentally killed her in the basement improvising partially with items in the home, including Linda possibly grabbing new underwear, although it isn't clear whether Jean Bonnet happened to be wearing those anyway. They fled the scene at some point during the night after cleaning things up. The note shows someone uneducated trying to sound educated and is sprinkled with movie references and educated phrases that could have been used by Patsy Ramsey in her own notes to Linda Hoffman Pugh. A lot of the ideas shed on Burke, like the feces things, were made up by Linda Hoffman Pugh. And it's actually, I don't, it's kind of unclear. I don't know if that's definitively been stated one way or the other. Also, her book chapter had similar short sentences with the exclamation point, like the ransom note. I noticed other similarities as well. Jameson posted that they were cleared by handwriting and DNA, and again... The handwriting experts, there's experts on both sides, and that's not a definitive science. And then the DNA, again, also using faulty old generation technology. So no one has been cleared by the latest generation DNA tech. I don't know how many times I have to say that. But I'm still interested in seeing them investigated to see if any of their friends may deserve a closer look. Another response here, I believe Mervyn was there, but he didn't do the actual murder. He had two other accomplices with him. I believe... One of them is a DNA match, two are dead, and one other male is still alive. A response by M. May 333. I've shared this list before, but I'd figure I'd share it again since so many have commented on this post. Below are several points that help support this potential theory. Both Linda Hoffman Pugh and Mervyn Pugh were in desperate need of money. They were behind in rent, needed to pay for serious dental work, food, etc. They both had keys. So I guess Mervyn had one key and Linda had the other. Linda had lost or misplaced hers when first asked for it by police. Interesting. So from Perfect Murder, Perfect Town, Hoffman Pugh was then asked to make a list of everyone she knew who frequented the house and a list of those who had keys. After two hours of intense questioning, she was so upset that for a moment she couldn't find her own key. What does that mean for a moment? Did At, at which point did she surface with the key, if at all? Or was her key missing permanently? They knew the family's dog would be gone and they never set the alarm. The Ramsey housekeeper plus a longtime babysitter both said the family left some doors unlocked and never used the alarm. Never? That's curious. So even when John Ramsey was home, they never used the alarm? That's kind of weird. So if someone knows they don't use the alarm, that's interesting information for would-be criminals. So both the pews knew where the cellar was and both denied it. They had recently taken Christmas trees out from there the month prior with the help of two additional family members. 
From the Boulder Police Report, number 5-607, a blunt-spoken man in his 50s. Pew had been in the Ramsey home a few times to help his wife, including a recent weekend where they spent three hours hauling Christmas decorations up from the basement. Quote from Linda, I didn't even know that room was there. How could a stranger know to go there? How in the world did this happen? The housekeeper's husband... This is from Boulder Police Report 5-29. The housekeeper's husband supposedly washed the windows at Thanksgiving time and supposedly went down in the basement and washed the basement windows. Report 5-607. Last time housekeeper's husband was there around Thanksgiving, cleaned all of the windows inside and out. Here's another curiosity we didn't go over yet. Linda Hoffman Pugh and Patsy Ramsey often communicated by leaving notes on that particular staircase and knew the back stairs were primarily used. See, that this is, oh man, this is another little piece of evidence here. If Linda specifically communicated with Patsy by leaving notes on that particular staircase, now do we know if it was in that exact same spot that the note was found? Also, Linda was incapable of giving a handwriting sample at first. From Perfect Murder to Perfect Town, in the kitchen, the police told the housekeeper that Jean Benet had been murdered. She screamed and couldn't stop shaking. After Hoffman Pugh settled down, they asked her to print some words on a sheet of paper. Mr. Ramsey, attaché, beheaded, and the number 118,000. But Linda was too upset to write. Interesting. Continuing on here. She knew the Ramsey's bedroom was a distance away on the third floor and they would likely hear nothing. I mean, yeah, we can't dismiss all these little points because a random intruder might not necessarily know the layouts of the bedrooms and where all of the individuals slept. Although if he got in there early enough, like that the other intruder within nine months of the Jean Benet murder who like actually hid in, in, uh, in someone's house not that far in Boulder and uh, sexually assaulted uh, a girl after hiding in her home for many hours. If the intruder got in there early enough and just meandered around all the rooms, I suppose he could have figured out the master bedroom with the photos, uh, you know, any kind of family photos, etc. maybe. But it's, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's rough. Linda had ample time to write the note with the pen and paper, could have taken the items home, or been responsible for the still missing pages torn from the center. And so this poster here is hypothesizing when she actually did take the items home. <laughs> so, wow. The police found similar black tape, three rolls, only one used, and similar white cord with an additional piece wrapped around a stick in their shed. They also found the same pads of paper and pens in their house. Okay, so, I mean, is it not a fact that she took him home? Or is this user alleging took him home, brought him back, and left it for the ransom note, which is also possible? Because a lot of the people that kind of dismiss any other theory other than Patsy did it, it trying to point to no, no intruder would take the time to write that, I mean, how does anybody know they wrote it in the house? It could have been written wherever. And we already went over the source for this information on everything found at their house from Thomas. Linda called in and missed work on the 24th due to a supposed fight with her sister over money. She also asked Patsy for a $2,000 loan at the time. Could have easily seen any one of John's pay stubs over the previous 11 months, which had his bonus printed on every one. Okay, all right. See, what? That's kind of weird. Huh. Huh. Is that true? He had his bonus printed on every single pay stub that month, that year. John's bonus was $118,117.50. Paid in February of 96, therefore printed on every pay stub of 96. Or someone part potentially overheard her saying, can you believe that man's bonus was $118,000? Linda thought or had heard the family use sayings like fat cat and southern common sense. Felt John was aloof and not very fond of him. Took the paint tote to the basement on the 23rd and the daughter bought her, borrowed one of Patsy's Christmas sweaters for the Ramsey's party that same night. The 23rd party. Was jealous of their lifestyle, felt they didn't deserve it, and had struggled her entire life. 
Patsy had hired her away from a cleaning service known as Mary Maids about 14 months earlier and befriended her new housekeeper. Hoffman Pugh had dropped out of high school as a sophomore, married at age 15, and had six children. She was wearing a pair of Patsy's old shoes as she spoke to police. So this isn't uh, this is not a housekeeper who's kind of in the middle income bracket. I mean, she is clearly struggling for money here, which can make people desperate. Again, I'm not alleging she's innocent or guilty, but this is clearly not a, a case of a well-to-do housekeeper who has a certain amount of money and just simply wants more and is greedy. That does not seem to be the case here. Linda had asked multiple times if they were afraid Jean Bonnet would be kidnapped prior to this happening. Detective Linda Arndt, date of report, January 8, 1997, Arndt talked with Patsy about when she found JonBenet missing, who had keys to the home, their vacation plans, and if Patsy had any ideas related to who might have kidnapped her daughter. Patsy told the detective about her housekeeper, the housekeeper's family, and how the housekeeper had recently asked to borrow money, $2,000. Arndt also wrote that Patsy's mother, by phone from Atlanta, had said that she wanted Detective Arndt to know that the housekeeper had told her, quote, many times, end quote, that Jean Bonnet was such a beautiful girl and asked her if Jean Bonnet's grandmother wasn't afraid someone was going to kidnap her granddaughter. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, when you have a poor family working on this house, the father has been had some criminal charges, regardless of how minor, I mean, criminal charges are criminal charges. It's just, yeah, this is tough. So they were both avid TV movie watchers. They knew the Ramses would be out at the Whites that night. There were several rumors online that certain members of their family were involved in sexually abusing children. I do not know if there is any truth to those rumors. Linda offered up the explanation that the Barbie gown must have been stuck to the white blanket when taken from the dryer. Linda was the first to volunteer information about JonBenet's serious bedwetting problem. This is uh, from Thomas again. Despite being overcome with grief, she furnished the startling information that the little girl had a problem wetting her bed. That was of great interest to the police. So what is he alleging there? That she was too upset to give a handwriting sample, but she wasn't too upset to talk about the little girl wetting her bed. I mean, is that the first thing someone would bring up when a child is missing and, and or found murdered? Is the first thing they would tell police is that the kid has a problem wetting the bed? That a young, ch I mean, that's a relatively common problem for, for extremely young children. I mean, I don't know about every single night, but regardless, to, to offer up that information while being too upset to give a handwriting sample, I mean, I don't know. What does everybody make of that? Could be something there. Apparently the police thought that was a little strange. So she changed her story about a Patsy being warm and kind to Patsy being evil and having a split personality. So this is Thomas's account here again. Hoffman Pugh had fallen apart with emotion at her home on Valley Drive in Fort Lupton when two detectives told her that Jean Bonnet was dead. This was what she had dreaded and warned the family about. The gorgeous child was allowed to roller skate and ride her bike all alone. And the nightmare had come true. My poor Patsy, she sobbed. I love Patsy like my daughter. Is that a little strange as well? I mean, she's, she's sobbing about Patsy? When Jean Benet is dead, the, the detectives tell her Jean Benet is dead, and she starts sobbing about Patsy? Does anybody find that strange? Also, if they really did let her roller skate and ride her bike all alone throughout the neighborhood all the time, I mean, I, I would actually say that's relatively reasonable for a housekeeper to be mentioning it to the parents or grandparents, aren't you worried about her getting kidnapped? If they're letting her do all of that, I mean, if that can be verified, if that's true, then this is a concerned housekeeper and it's not suspicious that she'd be asking about them being afraid if she was kidnapped. Yeah, I mean, a lot of variables here, a lot of variables. She lied about Patsy often drawing on Jean Bonnet's hand. I mean, how do they know she lied? I mean, so, I mean, yeah, I, I guess there'd be other people who could have theoretically witnessed that if that were true. Neither had alibis besides being home with one another. Mervyn slept on the couch, Linda in her bedroom. Linda was so distraught that she sold several hurtful and detrimental stories to the tabloids following Jean Bonnet's murder. She also started demanding pay for any interviews given, was vacationing in Florida and riding around in limos in the months following Jean Bonnet's murder. Again, if this is someone uh, 
of very low means, I mean, they might jump at the at any type of money. Again, like, you know, when you don't have food to eat and tabloids offer you money and you have a ton of kids, I mean, I don't think that specifically points to her guilt in any way. Supposedly, Linda's handwriting was similar from Thomas again. The handwriting in the ransom note, the mother said, also looked a little like the housekeeper's. The Reverend Raul Hoverstock told police about a phone call made that morning to Patsy's parents. Nedra and Don Pow in Atlanta, Mrs. Pow, he said, mentioned that Linda Hoffman Pugh had commented about how beautiful Jean Bonnet was and expressed the fear that someone might kidnap her. Linda said the following in Perfect Murder, Perfect Town, Just go away and leave me alone, Jean Bonnet said when I tried to help her with her boots. Sometimes she acted like a spoiled brat. Patsy spent a lot of time alone in the house while John was away on business. She never kept the baseball bat under the bed or base. Why, why mention the baseball bat, too? That's weird. Like, specifically a baseball bat as opposed to any kind of weapon. Never even set the alarm. She didn't like it because it was off accidentally, and it drove the police crazy. I was supposed to come back the next day, December 24th, and clean up. I called Patsy and said I couldn't. I told her I had a fight with my sister and needed some money to pay the rent. Here's the other thing, though. If you need money to pay your rent, why are you calling out of work? Like, if you got in a fight with your sister and your sister is your landlord, wouldn't you want to go to work and avoid that situation? I mean, I, I guess her sister doesn't live there, maybe, but whether she does or she doesn't, if she needs money that much, why not go to work and get the money? Is there something else going on, some other criminal element that involves some kind of loan that made these people even more desperate? Was Mervyn involved in some other criminal enterprises and he owed some really bad people money? And this level of desperation is what drove the Pews to possibly come up with this kind of scheme. I asked Patsy for a $2,000 loan. I told her I'd pay it back $50 each week. She didn't hesitate. Sure, she said she'd leave it in the kitchen counter for me my next regular visit December 27th. Again, I don't know. I, I believe Patsy disputes this. Merv said the following from Thomas again. Mervyn Pugh, the, the husband, was visibly intoxicated when he was interviewed, and the detectives knew he had a few brushes with the law back in Michigan. Is, so again, out of 50 states and nearly 200 countries, Merv's connection is it's not any of these other states other than Michigan and Georgia. It happens to be one of these two other states where the Ramseys are based. So there's three states out of 50. I mean, statistically here, it's just kind of weird. Is she missing or dead, he asked. How did she die? Was it natural strangulation or what? The questions were awfully close to the truth, close enough to raise police suspicion. Okay, so moving on here, one potential scenario. The Pews formed a plan to take John Bonet for money. They brought someone else on, either a relative or acquaintance, to split the cash. The person that agreed to carry this plan out was a deeply disturbed individual, more so than the Pews had thought. Once Jean Bonnet was in the basement, this person sexually assaulted her. She screamed. He hit her, strangled her to death. The kidnapping hadn't gone as planned, and the offender panicked. He left before retrieving the note he had placed on the staircase prior to taking Jean Bonnet to the basement. So is it possible Linda and Merv probably might have not even been at the house? They brought in some accomplice, one or more accomplices, gave them the key, gave them the plan and the ransom note written by possibly Linda using various handwriting samples she would have had of Patsy's. And then this person just did not do this, this job properly. And crazy, insane individual. Maybe there was two of them. Maybe he brought, maybe they brought one individual in on it. And this particular criminal brought another individual that they didn't know. And this was some kind of psychotic uh, sexual deviant. And perhaps even this, uh, the individual that the pews brought in didn't even know that this next degree of separation individual, because he was too afraid to do the job alone, he might have not even known that about this individual. I mean, in these criminal circles, the, the levels of psychosis and, and uh, deviancy can, can range quite, quite substantially. Other people are speculating that the police ruled her out based on her reaction of shock that Jean Bonnet was found dead. Is that because the, the other individuals, like if they were supposed to get, maybe they were supposed to get Jean Bonnet Ramsey out of the house, but they couldn't. 
Like, let's say Linda gave them the full layout of the house, and she even mentioned that back room, nobody goes in there. Like, you can hide in there until the time is right. Then you can creep upstairs and get Jean Bonnet. Or whatever the case may be. And then, if Burke was walking around or whatever, they got spooked, and they couldn't get out the way they wanted to. Like, what would they do? What, what would criminal deviants do when spooked? Especially if one of them might be a psychotic and is actually assaulting Jean Bonnet instead of just keeping her quiet. So if she really believed this would just be a standard kidnapping, Jean Bonnet would not be harmed, then of course she would have a massive reaction of shock even if she was involved in a kidnapping plot. So I don't see how they could rule her out based on that, but again, we're talking some possibly uh, under-equipped police officers here to handle this kind of this kind of case. So who's ready to go to mine shock land? So for those that don't know, Dorothy Allison was asked to uh, help on the Jean Benet Ramsey case, and she came up with a suspect sketch of the man who harmed Jean Benet Ramsey. He happens to look eerily like Mervyn Pugh. Now, <sighs> did Merv always have a mustache? Because the suspect sketch, there's no mustache. And you could argue he has a similarity to John Mark Carr as well. He looks similar to Merv, probably slightly more similar to Merv in certain instances, but yeah, especially the cheeks, the cheeks, and uh, even the hairline slightly. If you look at the hairline, I mean, it is quite eerie. Now, you would think, I mean, did Dorothy, Dorothy Allison made this sketch in 98, did she have access? Were there publicly available photos of Merv? at the time of the Dorothy Allison sketch. So let's go over the history of the sketch. So supposedly the sketch was created on the Lisa Gibbons show, April 27th, 1998, tracking Jean Benet's killer. If you haven't checked out our podcast on psychics that solve cases, there have been a ton of cases solved by psychics. That doesn't mean they use psychic powers, but there are a lot of people who say psychics have never solved any cases. I mean, there's a laundry list of cases, but we have a whole series on Mindshock about it, so you can check that out. But anyway, the Colorado Springs Gazette here, August 6, 1995. Tracking Heather's Killer. In 1992, Dorothy Allison, a noted New Jersey psychic who has worked with police across the country, called the Friends of Heather Dawn Church Foundation. I can tell you the killer's name right now, Allison remembered saying, his name is Brown, but not like the color brown, not spelled that way. No one is quite sure how the tip was pursued. The name was probably compared with those of everyone connected with the case, Smith said. Then it was forgotten. No one got religion, but in November, El Paso County Sheriff got a new sheriff, John Anderson, a former Colorado Springs police sergeant. Anderson soon hired an old partner, Lou Smith, as head of investigations. Smith, who had a knack for solving old homicide cases, made Heather a top priority again. Shortly after starting work last January, Smith reviewed Heather's file, a process he calls messing with a case. He asked his investigators to come up with something new, something that hadn't been tried. Tom Carney, a crime lab technician, immediately thought of the prints. We knew those fingerprints had to be from the suspect, he said. A better approach, he figured, would be an exhaustive mailing of quality photos of the prints to every police agency with an automated fingerprint identification system. Like the FBI system, AFIS compares fingerprint images electronically. AFIS computers aren't interconnected, but each one may contain prints that aren't in the hands of the FBI. Yeah, things were a lot different back in 1995. So Carney made 100 sets of photos of the three fingerprints and began sending them to 92 agencies with AFIS. Carney remembered thinking, if this doesn't work, that's it. On March 24th, someone from the Louisiana prison system called to report a match between the prints from the church home and prints in the database. The prints belonged to Robert Charles Brown with an E. He had spent time in Louisiana prisons for various crimes, including auto theft in the early and mid-1980s. He moved to Colorado in 1987 and after living at several addresses, settled into a home just down the road from the church residence. Considering all the publicity, detectives figured that he are from psychics. Some detectives scoff at psychics. Others are skeptical but willing to listen. I'm not going to disregard them, said Captain Lou Smith, now head of investigations for the sheriff's office. Sometimes psychics come up with things you can't explain, and sometimes they come up with things almost too hard to believe. 
So this is kind of weird. This is kind of weird. So how did she know that a guy named, not only brown, not only vague, like color, dark color name or a name that's a color, not only the color brown, but specifically not spelled like the color because the, the, the prince belonged to a guy with an extra E on brown. I mean, how do the coincidence theorists and the so-called skeptics explain that? It's kind of weird kind of weird. All right, so let's go over with the connection on uh, to the JonBenet Ramsey case. April 27th, 1998, Dorothy Allison described JonBenet's killer on the Lisa Gibbons show. He's probably 5'7 to 5'9. He's got thin brown hair that he wears over to the side, perhaps a little bit balding underneath. He has a very wide cranium on top and a real small chin. Very thin lips and a pointed nose, very light eyes, kind of Germanic descent, and a very slender build throughout the body, a little bit wide through the hips, high-pitched voice, and soft-spoken. So here's a recap of all the info provided by Dorothy Allison, April 27th, 98. One, Jean Bonnet was already dead by 11.25 p.m. on December 25th. 1996. Dorothy said the killer was hiding in a closet. Dorothy said Jean Benet's little shiny yellow raincoat was also in that closet. There could be a thumbprint on the shiny yellow raincoat. She said the killer always played hide and seek with Jean Benet by hiding in the closet. She said Jean Benet woke up to go to the bathroom. The killer grabbed her in the bathroom. She said the killer dragged John Bonet to a washroom where there were dirty clothes. She died from strangulation. That was the main cause of death. John Bonet trusted him. She felt that it was okay to be friendly with this man. She said the killer was a worker in the house like a janitor. He killed John Bonet because she recognized him. He didn't plan to kill her, but things got out of control. After he killed John Bonet, he then dragged her down some stairs. Dorothy stated, I believe this is how the man always came through the house, through the back door. She said, I get the name Irving or Irvin. I think he's the one who murdered this child. Mervin is quite close to Irvin, is it not? There's a connection to killer with Germany. Whether he's of Germ German descent, I don't know. S okay. Dorothy said, and something with Georgia, I keep getting Georgia. Huh. I see the numbers 289 or it could be 928. Could be reversed either way. And there's some connection to a Martin. That name comes very strong in my mind. Interesting. The killer fixed a leak in the bathroom about a few weeks before she was murdered. That's very specific information. Now, I don't know if he actually was confirmed to have fixed a leak or just worked on the tiles in the bathroom. She gave info to Boulder DA's office to the same man who worked the Heather Dawn church case, which, again, Dorothy Allison did get the name correct in that one. She felt JonBenet's presence strongest near the window grate. Huh. Interesting. Huh. She also stated that the little girl's parents were absolutely not involved and that the real killer was a former handyman. She perceived connections to Germany and Georgia, numbers 289 or 982, and the names Martin and Irving. And she worked with a police artist to determine, to, to produce this sketch. They also mentioned, I mean, there's, Dorothy Allison solved quite a bit of cases. TV's crackdown on crime 1997. Supposedly, Nutley police asked her to find a missing five-year-old boy. She did. He had drowned in a pipe during a storm. Huh. Weird. So she's fixated on the handyman. Hmm. So Merv also wasn't the only handyman that worked in the house. Let's touch upon Bob Wallace now. So Wallace and his friend were the ones that put the Christmas trees into the wine cellar. 
that the Pew family ended up taking out of the wine cellar later. So Wallace put hooks up outside the cellar room to hang wreaths. Wallace and or his friend made the elaborate gingerbread house for the Historical Society tour in 1994 and did the Christmas decorating. So John Ramsey says that Wallace helped Patsy with Christmas stuff. Wallace's friend Gilberto Rubio was a pastry chef and he made the 1994 gingerbread house. So apparently Nedra also suspected this guy. Also, John Ramsey states here that he thinks that Bob Wallace was gay. He worked 93 to 94, so not immediately recently. He also cleaned windows. In his interview, uh, John Ramsey didn't recall if Wallace was a handyman in 1996. Very interesting. I mean, there's really not a lot of information on Wallace here. So, yeah, I can't really find more information on Bob Wallace, but there is a uh, obituary for Bob Wallace in the Cheyenne, Mount, uh, Cheyenne Mountain area resident who died 2021 at 69 years old. And there's an older photo of him. It says he was an elite runner and marathoner. So supposedly, I mean, Bob Wallace is also, that's a relatively common name. So this might not be that guy. Unless this handyman also was a runner and marathoner in his spare time. If he was 69, I mean, or retired from that. So if he was 69 in 2021, actually it looks like it was 2020. So he would have been in his 40s during the time of the Jean Benet, Benet Rams while he worked there. I mean, years, maybe somewhere around 40 years old. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't look like the sketch. If this is even the guy, I'm not alleging it is. So, yeah, I mean, really not a lot of information on these guys. Wallace and his friend. I mean, I don't, I don't think a gardener would be... Confused with a handyman, but might as well touch upon Brian Scott here, the Ramsey landscaper and gardener. So he began working for the Ramseys in June 1995. The last time he was at the house was December 10th, 1996. And he was only, he, apparently he did fix a sprinkler clock in the basement. He was one of Nedra Powell's suspects. His girlfriend, Ann Preston, was investigated by Jane Harmer. Interesting. Brian Scott didn't know he was a suspect until Linda Arndt asked for handwriting, blood, saliva, and hair. He said he was only he had only been in the basement to fix the sprinkler clock. He didn't know there was a wine cellar, much less where it was. He did recall a broken window at the front of the house, but it was for the electrical cord for the Christmas lights. He said he didn't remember a broken window by the grate. So there were two broken windows? What? How many broken windows are there? His alibi is that he went to his girlfriend, Ann Preston, at 10.30 p.m. until midnight, then went home alone. So Scott, a graduate of the University of Colorado, we're not even going to mention the monumental stack of coincidences circulating the University of Colorado, but, uh, yeah, there's just, yeah, there, there, there are a lot of coincidences in this case. Apparently he was also cleared. Interesting. But, yeah, he doesn't quite look like the, uh, the sketch either. I mean, yeah, not, not really. I mean, yeah, not really. Here's an interesting post, The Constant Gardener's Tale, from the JonBenet Ramsey subreddit. I've been reading Perfect Murder, Perfect Town for the first time. I don't believe that I'm stepping on the book club's territory because the first chapter and intro have already been discussed. As an introduction to the case, the author, Lawrence Schiller, chooses to use the gardener's, Brian Scott's, memories of Jean Benet. Does anyone else find the gardener landscape person's recollection of Jean Benet a bit off, or is it just me? Scott's memories seem to go beyond the scope of what one would think a person hired to do yard work would be doing and thinking, which is landscaping, not interacting with a six-year-old child of the house. 
But before long, I made a game out of it. It was fun for both of us, he recounts, piling up some leaves. She would attach an exercise device to her ankle, and then as it rotated several inches off the ground parallel to it, she would hop the other leg over the cord as it swung by. She'd keep this up for long periods of time on the back patio, and she was very good at it. It was kind of a cool thing, demanded good reflexes and coordination. I even thought of getting one for myself. <laughs> And how and why does he know Jean Bonnet was involved in beauty pageants? And why is he commenting on the state of a little girl's legs? I don't know what to make of that. I've heard she was Little Miss Colorado and asked her if she was excited about winning the title. I don't really, I really don't care about it, she said. It didn't seem to be a very big deal to her, or if it was, she certainly didn't let on. I figured her leg work was for the pageants. I could see the muscles becoming defined in her calves. I've made a similar assumption when I saw her practicing the violin. I knew the competitions took a lot of preparation, but I never once saw her in makeup or costumes, never spotted her wearing anything but jumpers or jeans or shorts and t-shirts. Scott both praises her and puts her down. She was being kind of bratty. She, hit, she had a bit of smart Alec in her. Why, when he hears the child had died in horrible circumstances, does he drive by the Ramsey's house the very day of December 26th. He finds the house surrounded by cop cars and drives on by, but what was the imperative to go over there at a time like that, to gawk, to approach the Ramses, or to revisit the scene of the crime? The gardener was investigated, but he doesn't have a real alibi. Christmas night, he was at his girlfriend's place until about 12.30 p.m. I think it's supposed to be 12.30 a.m., and went home. On Christmas night, a boyfriend leaves his girlfriend in the middle of the night to go home. Huh. See, is that corroborated that he drove by the scene on the 26th? I mean, ooh, that, that does not look good. Because it's not like he works there every day. I mean, I don't know. So he provided DNA, hair, blood, and handwriting samples. And he was investigated by several different investigators. Huh. And again, regarding the DNA technology, nobody has been cleared with the latest generation DNA technology. And that's if the sample isn't even degraded enough to be used. I mean, it might already be too degraded to be accurate, but maybe it is, maybe it's not. Most of the posters allege that if there was anything truly suspicious about the guy other than driving by, like, people would have dug it up, like, with all these other things. Interesting, uh... An interesting post here by Gracie. He was explaining away any possible traces of himself in the basement. The whole section about this guy left me feeling investigators need to look closer at him. I have to keep in mind the writer is the one starting out with all this rose and thorn symbolism, plus the cycle of life whirlwind in the leaves he left her to play in. How much of this did he write himself? Does anyone else catch these vibes? He speaks of her like an adult. He says so. Her developed legs, her being older than her age. Six cycles of the sun to his 27. Underemployed for the amount of education. All kinds of thoughts swirling like his leaf pile. Reeks of creepy. There seem to be a lot of people that are kind of off surrounding John Bonnet Ramsey, like the, the McReynolds, etc. Hmm. I mean, a few more inter interesting uh, descriptions here. From an article on Romper.com by Kenza Muller, September 18th, 2016. What is Brian Scott doing now? The Ramsey family gardener is speaking up. Let's rewind to the Jean Bonnet case and Scott's initial involvement in investigation. He was initially interviewed by author Lawrence Schiller in 1999 for the book Perfect Murder, Perfect Town. Scott described Jean Bonnet's boundless curiosity and her seemingly disinterested attitude in the pageants she routinely took part in. I remember how intelligent Jean Bonnet was, Scott said, explaining to Schiller that he'd been a gardener at the Ramsey's home during the last two years of Jean Bonnet's life. That's why I never talked to her as if she were just a little kid. Scott relayed a story in which he and Jean Bonnet played with raked leaves. That was probably the last time I spoke to Jean Bonnet, to Scott told Schiller. Six weeks later, I took the morning paper from my front steps and saw it. I don't even remember now what the headline said. One of the two things that stood out in Scott's words to Schiller was his description of Burke Ramsey, Jean Bonnet's older brother, who has often been painted as a possible suspect by the public. He almost never said a word to me, Scott told Schiller, just played by himself in the backyard, completely occupied with his own projects. He always seemed to play alone.
Although Scott never came out and pointed a finger at Burke, his comments seemed to paint him in a light in a less than favorable light. Scott also brought up John Bennett Ramsey, John Bennett's father, when speaking to Schiller, relaying a story in which John Bennett cried over her father's absence. According to Scott, John Bennett said John would disappear for long periods of time, and that she didn't know where he went, and that she missed him. Scott told Schiller, I didn't know what to say, didn't know enough about the situation, didn't want to intrude or play counselor, it was my place. I changed the subject and started to rake up the leaves. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. There's really not a lot there. I mean, I would say the only weird thing is if he really drove by the house, but is that just curiosity? I mean, yeah, I don't know. There's really not a lot of info on this guy. In a 2016 interview, he stated that JonBenet would come out, I don't know, would be playing relatively close to where I would be, Brian Scott said. She seemed like a normal kid who liked to play and misses her father. I remember that. So, yeah, I mean, make of that what you will. But let's go back to uh, this sketch. Some people believe that this implicates Mervyn, especially with the similarity to Irvin. Mervyn, Irvin... I mean, the sketch does look like him, unless Dorothy Allison already had a photo of him. Because if she's close to Lou Smith, he would have files and photos, etc. Or they might have even been in the tabloids by that point. So she would have had a photo of him. She could have just made the sketch from him, knowing that he was a handyman in the house. If she had that information. Another poster here regarding uh, Linda. Once again, she's a big suspect. Some have said Ransom Note has feminine tone as well. She would be more likely to know about the $118,000 bonus amount. When people are desperate for money, they dream up all sorts of ideas how to get it. What goes against her is the sexual nature of the death. If something went wrong with a kidnapping, I, lean, I would lean more towards the perps just doing a quick murder. Also, apparently they never had Linda Hoffman Pugh write the note in her non-dominant hand. Another weird tidbit here from Benny Baku. I always thought it was odd Linda was reluctant to speak with Patsy at John Bonet's memorial service in Boulder. Patsy's sisters encouraged her to. By Linda's account, she asked Patsy if she was sure they had left a door unlocked. What a thing to ask a parent after such a horrific event. Another post here by Jen. I guess I've always just assumed if this theory is correct, Linda took the pad of paper that was used with Patsy's writing already in it somewhere, took it home and wrote the note complete with the practice note, then sent it back with the actual kidnapper and told him where to place it. I mean, she seemed to have no problem taking these pads of paper from the house as it was. Then Linda thought she was getting a huge payday and the kidnapper believed he could have his fun and assault JonBenet in the basement before he delivered her to Linda. But that went wrong when she cried out and he hit her over the head with the flashlight that he had been using. He flees the scene and the Ramses wake up to the aftermath. They never had Linda write the note in her non-dominant hand to have that to compare it to. Well, regardless, did they, apparently they were not able to rule her out based on the handwriting. Something else that doesn't get talked about is the floor safe in the Ramsey home and what potential intruders might want to do with that safe regardless of whether or not Linda knew that that safe wasn't used. Not to mention, depending, it, Linda could try to be the ringleader, but depending on what kind of criminal element she brings into this, they might not listen to her. Again, we're dealing with criminals, especially if these are low IQ criminals. Here's a post by Sarah five years ago on the JonBenet subreddit. Does anyone else here think that Linda Hoffman Pugh could have been involved? She went over all the stuff we already went over before. And then also this. Also something else that is often overlooked. Linda Pugh and her husband had been in that basement room before. I believe they were there to retrieve Christmas decorations. Both Linda and the Ramseys acknowledged that she had worked in the specific area of that basement. The crazier part is that there was actually a safe in that room that never gets talked about. If someone were going to kidnap a rich person's daughter for ransom money and knew about the safe, they definitely would go in that room and attempt to steal whatever was in that safe. Which would explain why they didn't immediately leave when they kidnapped JonBenet and could also explain the suitcase by the window. 
John Ramsey has acknowledged that the safe was never used, but an intruder seeing a safe in a wealthy person's home would assume it was packed with, val with valuable items. I'm just amazed that no one ever talks about the safe because it is a very significant piece of information for the intruder did it theories. Interesting follow-up post here by Stu. Your post is well thought out, mirrors some of the same suspicions that I originally had about Linda and her possible involvement. Linda was always the number one intruder did it suspect in my mind. Besides the family, she's at the top of the list in terms of access and motive. I think it's quite possible that some sort of ransom scheme was developed between Linda and her daughter and or son-in-law. If it was Linda, I do believe she had at least one accomplice. I don't understand why she was eliminated so early on in the investigation. It's not really a big deal to me that she cooperated with the police early on. Many did, except the Ramseys. Oftentimes, the culprit of a crime turns out to be someone that the police have already interviewed. Why her family wasn't put under the microscope really makes me scratch my head considering many of them were in the wine cellar room recently. They sure investigated the expletive out of Fleet and McReynolds, who were far less suspicious in my mind. The ransom note initially appears to me either be either to be Patsy framing Linda or Linda framing Patsy. The note was either written by an intelligent person under extreme duress, like Patsy, or an unintelligent person trying their best attempt at sounding educated, like Linda, who had more time to put it together. She had access to the home and the notepad. I think it's super suspicious that she asked for a huge loan and then didn't show up Christmas Eve for her scheduled cleaning time. If I was to ask my employer for that kind of cash, I would literally have to be dying to not show up for work before I got it. Did she lose her nerve? Uh, well, and going back to that point, I mean, that is strange. She doesn't show up for work and she asks for that huge amount of money. And this is Christmas time, too. This isn't just like a random weekend or a random day. This is Christmas time and she's not coming to tidy up the home for Christmas? And she's asking for that kind of cash? Was there some kind of falling out with the Ramseys that just hasn't been publicized to a certain extent? Like before the crime, before the kidnapping, was there a falling out that might have precipitated this event? Did she lose her nerve? People often act erratic before and after they commit a crime. Police should have been asking way more questions in my opinion. Perhaps the loan was concocted as an excuse if she got caught inside the house and had absolutely no other reason to be there. The random DNA could belong to someone Linda or her daughter knew. Having said that, there are several things that point to a Ramsey did it scenario, but this is already getting long-winded. I will only mention my main one, the pineapple. It always boils down to the pineapple for me. Can't deny it or explain it away. It's definitely there, and she ate it shortly before she died. That's actually disputed as I went over. It could have been from the fruit cocktail. It wasn't specifically pineapple. It was fruit consistent with pineapple that may or may not have been part of a fruit cocktail at the party that John Bonet was at previously. So this is all unknown. So there's a bowl there with Patsy and Burke's fingerprints on it. That See, here's the thing, though. What if Linda put out that bowl of pineapple that she knew that Burke... Like, was there a backup plan? Or if this is a kidnapping gone wrong and then they panicked and they wanted to divert attention away from themselves, would she put out that cup with Burke's that she knew had Burke's uh, fingerprints on it because it wasn't washed. I mean, she wasn't even there to clean up. And she said there was always dishes all over the place. Nothing was ever washed anywhere. I mean, she would know all that information. But continuing on with this post, the other thing that bothers me regarding the Linda angle is the sexual assault. Garrett, if the plan was to kidnap for ransom, as soon as the plan went haywire, they would GTFO out of there as soon as possible, particularly if indeed she did let out a scream in the basement. Why would Linda or anyone stick around to tie a garret around her neck, poke her with a paintbrush, tie the paintbrush into the garret, strangle her, wipe her body down, redress her with huge brand new panties they seemingly already took out of her room for no reason, pose her, tuck her in the blanket, etc., etc.? Did they really believe that for sure no one would hear anything in that creaky old ass house? I don't know. Maybe they just didn't care if they got caught. Everything about this case is strange. You can poke holes on either side. But I definitely agree that if Intruder did it, Linda is definitely my number one suspect. Okay, I have another theory. 
This is an this is the Maguire theory if an intruder did it. My previous Maguire theory is that an intruder did it, but Patsy and John Ramsey might have thought Burke did it. I'm going to build on that right now in typical mind shock fashion. I hope everybody is sitting down. This might be one of those mind shocking theories yet. So an intruder did it. Let's say it was Linda and or her accomplices. Then they get out of there. Is it possible Burke discovers her body? He wants to get a pineapple snack, whatever. Or, or not, if, if Linda or her accomplices just threw that out there. Either way, Burke, R Burke meanders through the house. Maybe he even heard something going on, but by the time he gets to the basement, nobody is there. So, cause, I mean, you would think if they would be willing to kill Jean Benet Ramsey, they would probably have killed Burke if he saw them. So let's say they're gone and Burke discovers her body. Is it possible he poked and prodded her in various ways because he wasn't sure if she was alive or dead? And then that's why he's on the phone call saying, what did you find? Because he was scared that he would get in trouble. He would think that he did that too. And again, in his, in his own mind, is it possible he thought he could be responsible? I mean, again, without knowing his exact mental state, his exact mental development level. I mean, at that time, there weren't these advanced cognitive tests that there are now to truly determine how high, how functioning he was mentally. Is it possible he thought that she could have been dead because he was mean to her or he had hit her previously, like a day before, two days, maybe even at the party? In his non-developed child brain, is it possible he really thought that he was responsible for her death, even if he wasn't? And then the parents think that he is. And then they cover for him. And then maybe later they find out, oh, he really didn't do it. It was an intruder. Like, what are they going to do at that point? Or vice versa. If they thought it was an intruder and then they truly start believing it was him, I mean, what are they going to do? Flip their story at that point? Because they're locked in with a lot of their lies and cover up, even if they're all innocent. So... Yeah, that's just the follow-up McGuire theory there, because what if Burke really did find her dead body, and he did poke and prod her in various ways, but he wasn't the one that killed her. So here's a follow-up. Here's how it went down in my mind. This is also by Sarah. Linda is working with two other males. I think when the letter says that Jean Bonnet was being watched by two men, that it was an accidental truth. The males were tasked with kidnapping John Bonet while Linda is tasked with writing the letter. If Linda was involved, she would not be able to be seen by John Bonet because she would recognize her face or voice. Linda could potentially be seen out in the open because she had a reason to be at the Ramseys to pick up the check that the Ramseys left out for her. I don't believe the plan was to murder Jean Bonet, but the note and the kidnapping were separate, so she wrote the note with the impression that Jean Bonet would be kidnapped by the time the Ramseys read the letter. After the two male accomplices took Jean Bonet, they went down to the basement, not for an easy escape, but to try to open the safe that was in the same room Jean Bonet was found in. They wanted quick money. Maybe they were planning on just leaving her there alive if they could escape with whatever was in the safe, but they never opened the safe and for some reason ended up killing her. Probably because she was dying from the blow to the head and they panicked. Like, yeah, if these are inexperienced, dumb criminals that have never even dealt with children, but they've dealt with, let's say, unruly adults, if they bop her on the head, like, they don't think it's a hard bop, but this is a very, very small child with a thin skull. I mean... If they're used to the physical violence with grown, if they're grown men and they're used to physical violence with grown men, they might have just wanted to hit her gently, but they hit her way too hard. Another follow-up by Stu, that's a good theory. I never really thought about the safe or someone trying to get inside of it that night. I pretty much agree with this as the most plausible theory in an intruder did it scenario. Linda not showing up for work that day leaves a reasonable explanation as to why she would be in the house that night if she did get caught. She would be most likely person to leave the note for Patsy on the back stairs. I also think she probably formed some sort of an affection towards Patsy. And out of guilt or some sort of undoing in her mind, she switched the ransom note from Mr. and Mrs. Ramsey to just Mr. Ramsey. I don't know why I think this. I just intuitively think that the intruder knew Patsy more personally than John. Therefore, leaving her out of the note in an attempt to spare her. If an intruder really exists, which I don't necessarily believe in this case, this is where my mind goes. You know what? I mean, this is a pretty decent plan. If they're planning a kidnapping and to receive money while Jean Benet is still in the house, like, what if they originally just planned to tie her up and leave her in the room? 
because that's a lot less risky, right? Like you're not actually killing anybody. You just tie her up, you tape her mouth, you leave her in the uh, in that room, and then all of the intruders just leave and they're to pick up the uh, money. Once the money's dropped off, they place a phone call. Oh, by the way, Jean Benet's in your basement. I mean, is it possible that this can all be explained, like all of John Ramsey's weird shadiness? Because if he thinks Burke did it, would he start staging briefcases and making it look like an intruder did it, even if he doesn't believe there's an intruder, even if there really was an intruder and multiple intruders? Does all the funny business add up in this scenario where it's Linda and her accomplices, possibly even including McReynolds? I mean, I don't, I don't know if I want to go down that rabbit hole for this podcast, but they're, they're also Chris Wolf is a very shady character. I mean, I don't know how many people could have been involved here, but it's tough. It's, it's really, really tough. But does it all make sense if there is some kind of... Because this is a really safe kidnapping. Because trying to leave a home with a child and transporting a child in a ransom and in a kidnapping operation for a ransom... That's hard. And then once you get the money, I mean, how are you going to get the kid back? It's all so dangerous. If you lock the kid in a room that nobody knows about or a few people know about, they wouldn't necessarily look. Or at least maybe if they do look, you don't get your money, whatever. At least you tried. It was a good try. Because in the off chance that they don't find her and they do deliver the money, then this is a lot less risk for the kidnappers because then they could just place a call. Anonymous call from a payphone. She's in the base. She's in the wine cellar room in the basement. Thanks for the cash. See, a kidnapper who actually cares about Jean Benet and the family, they might actually do something like this. See, some kind of foreign faction. I mean, obviously, they usually do kill the kidnapped victims, so they wouldn't go through with something like this. But this actually kind of makes sense if the kidnappers actually care about Jean Benet and possibly even Patsy Ramsey, and they really do not wish to harm Jean Benet in any way or kill her. And they just want to take the least amount of risk possible. This is kind of like a low-risk kidnapping situation. And even if they got caught, like, what's the crime for, like, tying up a child in their own home, though? Like, you don't actually take them out of the home. I mean, obviously, that's a crime. That is totally criminal. But that can't be the same charge as actually removing them from their family home. Because you tied them up. That's totally a crime. It is totally a crime. Uh, but that's a lot different than actually, you know, removing them from the property, not, to, you know, the risk factor, all of that. So I actually think this theory is plausible. All right, so let's get even more into mind shock land. So the previous housekeeper, Jameson brought forth this information. It's unclear the exact timeline, but Lynn Wilcox was previously a housekeeper at the Ramsey House. She lost her job after nosing around in some personal papers. Detective Harmer interviewed her briefly. Uh, here is the statement here. Over Thanksgiving break in 1994, the Ramseys went to Georgia. I was working for them as their housekeeper. When I came to work Monday morning, the house was flooded. A window in John's third room bathroom had been left open by a painter. Then the window blew the shutter, which apparently hit the hot water control in the shower and turned it on. The water must have been running for three days. It destroyed the bathroom floor, ran down into John Andrews, John Ramsey's oldest son, closets and out into his room and on the second floor and all the way down into some rooms on the ground floor. When John and Patsy showed up, they went straight upstairs. We were all standing in the bathroom. There was water everywhere. John was in his stocking feet. He always took his shoes off when he came into the house. He slammed the window shut, then he realized his socks were wet. That made him furious. He was more mad about his socks being wet than about the house being ruined. You know, that that's an interesting point there. What does it make of that? I looked into his eyes that it almost changed color. He was so angry, really angry. I don't know how to explain it. It was like a light switch had come on behind his eyes. It was the last straw. He didn't freak out, didn't throw things, but you could see the rage. You could feel it. I mean, it was powerful. I wanted to get out of the room, but Patsy was standing between me and the door. I'm not saying he didn't have a right to be angry. I'm just saying I saw him angry. I saw the coldest eyes. He never said a word, but it was right there in his face. It was palpable. Patsy was freaking out. It was, what are we going to do? We're having the Christmas house tour. He was angry, but she was in a total panic. The floor had ruined Patsy's image of what a perfect house should look like. 
Interesting comment from Linda Wilcox, July 1998. Patsy didn't want a dog, and she didn't want Jean Benet to have a dog. This particular dog didn't get the potty training thing down very well. He tended to leave puddles. He was pretty much relegated to the wood floor at the bottom of the spiral staircase and out the side door off the patio. John told Patsy to get John Bonet a dog. Patsy chose a Bichon. Jameson's comment regarding this, uh, this was apparently from a news article or whatever. My comment, not sure how much of this is true. I would think both kids would have been teasing for a dog and John would be less likely to tell Patsy to get a dog than Patsy would agree to get one because she liked giving the kids what they asked. But a dog was adopted and it became clear Burke had allergies. The dog was relocated to the Barnhill house. The allergies were verified by Burke's medical records. Apparently Linda Wilcox also had a key to the house. So, Perfect Murder, Perfect Town, page 435. Another item on the detective's list was locating the missing keys to the Ramsey house. Jay Petapiece, a painter, told the police he couldn't find his key. Suzanne Savage, one of the Jean Bonnet's babysitters, found her key. She told Detective Harmer that she had never copied it or allowed anyone to have it, but remembered giving an extra, but remembered giving an extra one to Linda Wilcox. Man, everybody, even the painter, I mean, everybody has a key to this house. Wow. Also, apparently Lynn Wilcox also stated that she did know about the windowless wine cellar room and that all of the help knew about the room as well. So basically all of the housekeepers would have known about that room. Apparently Linda Wilcox was also the one who actually discovered the floor safe in the wine cellar room and showed it to Patsy Nedra and Suzanne Savage. So nobody even knew the safe was there until, until Linda Wilcox discovered it. No date here. So Wilcox worked for the Ramseys approximately two and a half years from March 93 to September 95. September 4th, 95. So she, she has only a month, approximate month of the start of her employ, but she knows the exact date she stopped. Another interesting piece here is uh, Linda Wilcox said this, I don't remember if I told them about the large photograph John had of an aircraft carrier. On the bottom of the picture in fancy writings were the words Subic Bay Training Center. The script was faint because it was blended in with the water, so the words were hard to read. It used to hang behind his desk in the bedroom. Interesting information here. So her alibi, seemingly she has a pretty solid al alibi. She was at her grandmother's funeral out of town. So if, I mean, if she was really at, you know, some great distance from Boulder and plenty of people saw her at the funeral, that would place her away from the house at that particular night. Of course, that doesn't necessarily rule her out as giving possible information or being disgruntled. I can't find too many, I can't find information here on her going through private papers of the Ramseys. Is it possible someone paid her off to get information on access graphics? I mean, yeah, this billion dollar company. I mean, yeah, it's, yeah, it's weird. Okay, so I actually found a little bit more information. This is from bestfreeforums.com from way back in the day, starting over Jean Benet. A new look at the Jean Benet Ramsey homicide forum from 2006. So, from an interview, from the 1998 Lou Smith interview between John Ramsey and Lou Smith, they mention this guy, Jay Pettipies. And this is the guy I mentioned earlier, the painter. So let's get into him. Lou Smith asks, who was the painter? John Ramsey says, Jay Pettipies. The reason I remember this is when it was over with, he went into the house just to finish up some last little touches. We're going to be out of town. Patsy told him, please close the windows when you leave. And he left the windows open in my bedroom and bathroom. The wind blew hard, blew open the four shutters, which turned on the faucet and flooded the whole house about two weeks before the home tour. So, very interesting. So now, here is a more in-depth piece from the Crime and Justice Forums. This is an interview between Peter Boyles and Linda Wilcox. 
And there's more details here. Wilcox says the flood, that was an interesting one. What had happened was that Jay, the house painter, I don't know his last name, but that particular bathroom was John's bathroom. They each had their own bathroom, John and Patsy, and neither used the other. It was too weird. And the way it was set up, like I said, it was a big whirlpool bathtub and it had a handheld shower attachment that hooked to the side of the tub. The handles were the long skinny handles. Behind those long skinny handles were one of those louvered kind of window covers you close like a shutter. The house painter had been painting. It was over Thanksgiving break. It had been warm. He'd been painting and he left the window open. We got some of those big wind storms. The wind blew the shutter open just enough to hit the handle on the hot water faucet and it started running through the shower head, but it didn't reach the bathtub. It went off the side onto the floor and it ran for three days. Hot water. I come in the Monday after Thanksgiving, I get upstairs and it was like a sauna. I heard water running and turned it off and at the same time I wasn't sure how much damage had been done. I cleaned it up the best I could and then I started looking. It had gone all the way under the big armoire type things and into Patsy's sitting room. It had gone through the ceiling and into John Andrews' bathroom downstairs all the way to the first floor guest bathroom. It did approximately $20,000 worth of damage. I had just recently purchased a steam carpet cleaner, which I happened to have in my car. I figure, I figure I better get it cleaned up because they were due back in town, but because of the fog in Atlanta, they couldn't fly back that day. I went to call his office, and I looked through the top drawer of his desk to see if I could find a business card for Access Graphics. So is this why she got fired? And I'm upstairs in his office since there's a phone in there looking for it. I couldn't get an outside line. I'd been there almost two years at this time and I didn't know you had to dial one to get an outside line. I thought maybe one of the wires had gotten wet or something because I couldn't even get a dial tone. So I get in my car and I found a pay phone do any of the young people know what that is? <laughs> Listening to mine, Chuck? And called his secretary, who I think her name was Lori. And Peter Boyle states here, Lori Wagner. Linda responds, okay, I called his secretary. I get a hold of her and I explain the situation. I explained to her that I was having trouble with the phone. She said, well, just go ahead and answer today and I'll call you back. She called me back and she told me to look around. I thought I could still hear water running, but it turns out it was the steam heat because the window was open. It had come on and I couldn't close the window. It was really jammed because the water had made it swell. I couldn't close the window and it was eight in the morning. Well, I spent the whole day there. Especially John Andrew's room, it was worse, it was flooded. I was using the steam cleaner to extract the water. At about 8 o'clock that night, I'd been there 12 hours, they got home. I go down to the stairs and Patsy was like, well, what are you still doing here? And I told her about the situation. So they go upstairs with me. The first thing John did every time he walked into the house was take his shoes off. He never wore shoes in the house, ever. And I remember we walked up to the master bedroom and I showed him the bathroom and what had happened and said, oh, I can't close the window. Well, John gets in the bathtub. He yanked open the shutter and he slammed the window down. He's standing there in the bathtub with his stocking feet. I'd gotten most of the water, but it would like creep up between the tiles and he got his feet wet. He got really ticked. You could see it in his face. It was like his eyes changed color. He was so mad. But he has extreme self-control and unless you're looking for it, you miss it. But I looked at him and I thought this guy is ticked. Although he wasn't acting it and he didn't say it. He just very calmly said, man, I'm going to fire Jay right now. He's going to pay for this. Peter Boyles asks, how was it Jay's fault? Linda responds, well, because he left the window open. Jay forgot and left the window open, and when it blew in and turned the water on, that's what, the, what turned the water on. Peter asked, was Jay fired? Linda responds, actually, he wasn't. And insurance covered the cost, and I guess John forgot about it. I think he actually did leave. Jay had some kind of accident at a different house, and he had left. See, they don't think about people except little things annoy them. At one point, it was later. It was almost summer by this time. It took him forever to paint the house. He was kind of slow. But it was summer and it was hot and he had all the screens off and Burke couldn't open his window to get any air because there was no screen. And Burke's out front, which is a straight fall, and Nedra didn't want him up there with the window open. And Nedra was all upset at this. She goes, man, this kid can't even open his window And when they were trying to get a hold of him. And they had some people working inside, hanging wallpaper and painting, and they were going to take over the inside, and Jay got mad. I'm not sure what happened with all that. Lawsuits were threatened back and forth. I'm not sure what happened after that point. So here we have yet another disgruntled employee in a long line of disgruntled employees. Now, that doesn't mean he's responsible for anything. It's just curious. It's just curious. And we're going to go over yet another disgruntled employee, Dennis Kelly. Kelly was a painter who painted the Ramsey basement in either 95 or 96. 
The Ramses were sent a letter stating that this individual had a grudge towards the Ramses. Okay, wow. And this basement painter was wearing an ankle monitor. So how many ex-cons worked in the Ramsey home? How many shady individuals and how many non-shady individuals but ones with grudges? Disgruntled employees. So he was on restricted duty. So apparently a guy in Boulder who lived near Kelly is a fairly dysfunctional fellow. This is a John Ramsey Atlanta interview regarding the basement painter and the witness. He was wearing an ankle monitor when he was painting our basement, apparently. I don't know how this was known, but obviously he was supposed to be on restricted duty. Mr. Ramsey, are you speaking of Mr. Kelly as the person who painted your basement? Yes, Dennis Kelly. Right, yeah, I mentioned I, a wealthy friend I visited, da da da, and then Kelly said, yeah, I know some rich people. Who? The Ramses. He seemed to have some sort of grudge against you, which he wouldn't explain. But this was March 2000. So, and also Mr. Gray stated that they never followed up with Dennis Kelly. So this guy that knows Kelly is basically telling the Ramses that he's got some kind of grudge, apparently. Or was this just drunk ramblings of a of some ex-con who, uh, who happened to paint the basement. I mean, I don't know. This is all very, very weird. Now, if you want to go even deeper into Mind Shock Land, there was actually also a sex offender who worked at the Ramsey home. And apparently he, quote, lost it a few days after the murder. This is posted by Jameson, October 23rd, 2003, Web Forum, dot -E 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 org. The BCTC suspect. There was a sex offender who worked for the Ramseys at some time. He lost it a few days after the murder. At some point, he was at the Boulder Community Treatment Center facility. The three-story structure houses 64 residents. Both men and women are served at this location. Looking at a map, it is also clear that this facility is south of Pearl Street, and I wonder if anyone there ever called it South Boulder Treatment Center. SBTC. Huh. It seems this man was in and out of jail and rehab. His name was given to police in early 97, and they took saliva samples from him, but it is unclear if they actually did anything with those samples. The sad fact is that in many cases they take samples but don't check them. I'm wondering if anyone knows anything about the facility. Was it ever called the South Boulder Treatment Center? The man's name has never been made public, and I don't believe he has ever been discussed. But I'm throwing this out there to see what happens. Another post here. The Boulder police had his name, and so did the DA investigators. There was a man who was in the jail off and on. He had a history. I'm sure they checked him. I'm not accusing him at all. will not release his name. I am more interested in in the fact that there was a treatment center south of Pearl Street, which I always took to be a main landmark in Boulder. The college was the other. And I wonder if he was interviewed. Maybe he lost it because he knew something, just a thought. Okay, so a guy in this treatment center just happens to go crazy a few days after the murder, and he happened to work at the Ramsey home. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. What are we making of all these coincidences? All right, so let's go over the Pew Crew theory. This was uh, also on the Jean Benet Ramsey Encyclopedia, JeanBenetRamsey.pbworks.com. This is a theory involving Linda Hoffman Pew, her husband Mervyn Pew, and either one or two accomplices. One very likely accomplice was Michael Helgoth. Other possible accomplices include Gary Howard Oliva, Michael Kennedy. John Gygax, and uh, another individual that I don't believe has been named before. I'll just use his first name here, possible first name, Jeremy. The Pew Crew Theory. The fact that this was the murder of a beautiful and innocent six-year-old girl, 
and that it appeared she was sexually assaulted deeply planted the seed that distracted us all from what would later become evidence, hard facts, and the truth regarding the Jean Benet Ramsey case. She was murdered in her own home, and then there is possible allegations of prior sexual abuse. The media informed us that most handwriting experts concluded that the now famous ransom note was most likely authored by a woman. Patsy must have done it. Twenty years later, now Burke did it. Sadly and unjustly, the Ramseys were quickly convicted in the court of public opinion. As time passes, the suspect list still grows and new theories continue to spring up. The case has become so complex that it seems it would never be solved. But you will now see it is not that complex at all and actually pretty simple. For a moment, I humbly ask you to please set your feelings aside and mentally throw away any and all past judgments and opinions you've had about the case. Now remove the entire cast of characters, including Jean Bonnet. Now we begin. Look at the crime scene as a whole. A family of four whose daughter was abducted from her bedroom and a ransom note was left behind. Father was known to have money and was targeted for ransom. We now know she was murdered, but pretend that the mother just made the 911 call. Please remember that at this point, the case was still considered a kidnapping. The ransom note was their only confirmation of that fact. Primary motive, money. Plot. This was a kidnap for ransom that went horribly wrong. To start, the ransom note is in fact a ransom note. A child was kidnapped and it was left behind. Specific rules were supposed to be followed, but were not. And the girl was murdered. Exactly how the ransom note warned them it would happen. The actions that took place between 5.45 a.m. and 6 a.m. sealed that little girl's fate. In an interview, I heard the father mention that the ransom note was a huge clue and not sure why they would have left it behind. Sadly, even then he didn't realize what was planned and what actually had happened that day and the true meaning of the ransom note. Very early in the investigation, the parents maintained that the daughter was killed in a botched kidnap for ransom. Biggest overlooked clue in the case is the floor safe. Did you even know there was a safe? And did you know that the safe was hidden on the floor of the basement in the wine cellar, which was the actual room that Jean Benet's body was found? The official crime scene. Yet since the murder of Jean Benet, very little has been said about it and not much information has ever been released about the floor safe. It's important to note that even though the Ramseys never used the safe, nobody else ever knew that. So I ask that you please do not under underestimate the mysterious powers that a safe can hold in our minds. To some, a safe is nothing, and to others, it's everything. What we now know is that it was a combination lock floor safe, and it was never opened that night or that morning. John Ramsey and his friend Fleet White found the girl's body wrapped in a blanket less than five feet inside the door, lying next to a small gray safe embedded in the cement floor. Family representatives said the Ramseys found the safe when they bought the home, but never had the combination. After getting the search warrant, police investigators drilled the safe to open it, but did not reveal what contents, if any, they discovered. That's kind of curious. Like, if it was empty, why not? Would they not say? Mm, I guess, now that, I guess if for a true perpetrator who is responsible, maybe they think there's some kind of connection there. I'm pretty sure that the kidnapping protocol shouldn't be just an unknown hidden location, but, but it can be somewhere in the woods, it can be in another city or right next door, or it can even be as close as the basement. Law enforcement should have done a better job at protecting the Ramseys by first reading the ransom note and finding out exactly what it entailed. And being that law enforcement are now clearly involved and the kidnapping did take place, why weren't the bloodhounds brought in right away? Even if it isn't protocol, isn't it common sense in a case where a child was taken from her own bedroom of her own home? Did the police even read the ransom note well enough? Ransom note. Forget who wrote it or who touched it or what professionals have said about it. And take it exactly how it is. A strange, already pre-planned out, three-page kidnapping ransom note. Now please allow me to introduce you to the Pew crew, which is Linda Hoffman Pew, the housekeeper, who we now know to be the mastermind of this entire operation, her husband, Mervyn Pew, and possibly one or two accomplices. One very likely accomplice was Michael Helgoth now deceased. Possible accomplices, Gary Howard Oliva, Michael Kennedy, Chris Wolf, Jeremy, and John Stephen Gygax. Can any of these six be directly linked to the pews? Such an act of violence would only be in character for someone driven by hatred and greed, and that someone was Linda Hoffman Pew. If you take the ransom note at face value and squeeze it down to five words, it would read, give money and follow the rules. 
They planned the expletive out of this kidnap for ransom. Money-hungry criminals often do that. Forensic TV shows were already around in 1996 to study and learn from. These suspects wore gloves, brought flashlights, duct tape, white nylon cord, taser, masks, walkie-talkies, a police scanner. No gun, too loud if they wanted their plan to work. They had plenty of time to snoop around and gain access to the Ramsey's personal information and plenty of time for Linda to copy the pre-written ransom note onto Patsy's notepad. It is important to note that after analyzing the ransom note, it seems that it was for Friday, December 27, and not for the morning of Thursday, December 26th. It was found on the 26th at 6 a.m., and the ransom call would be tomorrow at 8 to 10 a.m. Huh. Has anyone ever interpreted it that way? Be well rested, it said, but they just woke up. So even though law enforcement brought in a detective for the phone wiretaps, they were a day off. This doesn't change our theory, being that whether it was for Thursday or Friday, the final results would have yielded the same outcome, being the actions taken between 5.45 and 6 a.m. that morning. Just how the ransom note was written like a movie, so was their plan. While the Ramses were at the White's Christmas, White's house Christmas evening, they were having a white Christmas? Man, the names in this case, oh man. They broke into the Ramsey home the easiest way possible, with the keys, and were possibly hoping to open the safe. Maybe when it wasn't possible to open it, they came up with the ransom idea, or what we now feel they did, which was planned and plotted this for weeks. Kidnap for ransom. Keep it small in the hopes that maybe John has that much in the floor safe and possibly ruse to get him to open it, or maybe they can get John to get it from the bank without raising any suspicions, being that $118,000 isn't questioned as much as $1 or $2 million would be. That's actually a good point as well. But here's the thing, though. Were they really hiding in that room if the safe is also in that room? Were they planning to kill John Ramsey when he got down there? And if that's where they were holding John Bonet? I mean, that's kind of weird. Perhaps even the $2,000 that Linda wanted to borrow from Patsy might have been to pay her accomplices. Or, wow, that's an interesting thought if they need upfront payment. Or maybe hoping they would have that much in the safe. She agreed to loan her the money and would have her check, and Patsy stated that Linda would let herself in to pick it up while they were gone for the holidays. Maybe even another excuse for Linda if the Ramses woke up in the middle of the night that she was coming for the check. When the pews were working in the Ram Ramsey home near Thanksgiving time, one of them or somebody with them went snooping around and found the floor safe. Or what we might think happened now was that one of the previous housekeepers, Linda Wilcox and company, found the safe and possibly let the pews know about it. Of course, we now know that the safe wasn't even used by the Ramses. But nobody else knew that. And the safe is in the house of a man whose business just made a billion dollars in sales. Score. The plan. This was the first big crime, kidnapped for ransom. Their biggest gamble of this entire plan was whether the Ramses would call the police or not. 50-50 chance. That southern common sense of his should make him pay up for his daughters, kidnapper said. Listen carefully. We have your daughter. Get us the money or she's dead. We will contact you tomorrow between 8 and 10 a.m. As they were already lying in wait in the basement with Jean Benet and they just and just how they meticulously planned this kidnap for ransom, they probably planned an escape route as well as a backup escape route. I mean, why keep why the extra day though? That's kind of weird. 118,000 ransom was to be split 50-50, half to Helgoth and partner, the other half to Linda and Mervyn. Possibly an ignorant person might believe they could extort $118,000 from someone without getting caught, especially if they can convince that someone not to call the authorities. See, that's where the simpleton angle can work either way, because if they're that simpletons, they might have actually thought this could work. After hearing that the police were called, the kidnappers finished off Jean Bonnet with a flashlight or bat and escaped through the basement window to the getaway vehicle parked down the street with no ransom money. It's very important that you treat the upper two floors of the Ramsey house and the wine cellar in the basement as two completely different locations. Even though it's in the same house, it was large enough to make this scenario possible. It was a 6,800 square foot, 15 room house with four stories, including the basement. After everyone fell asleep, Linda quietly grabbed Jean Monnet out of her bed and took her to the kitchen and fed her pineapple. When Linda realized nobody else in the house woke up, she took Jean Monnet to the basement. Or they might have possibly staged a kidnapping in the kitchen as she fed her. 
Masked men grab her and they take her down to the basement. That's when Linda wiped down the flashlight she had, set it on the kitchen counter. See, that's an even better idea because now Linda can show her face and if she lured John Bonet down, these masked men could pretend to attack Linda as well. Therefore, if Jean Bonet was never planned to be harmed, she could she would have the same story as Linda. That's when Linda wiped down the flashlight. She set it on the kitchen counter, neatly set the ransom note on the staircase, and left the house. She wouldn't be able to fit out of the basement window. The big heffa was the lookout, waiting in the getaway vehicle parked down the street with a walkie-talkie and a police scanner. Who else would be able to quietly and successfully grab Jean Benet out of her bedroom in the middle of the night, take her to the kitchen, and eventually to the basement without waking up anyone in the house? A perpetrator who is com comfortable moving freely throughout the entire house. Note, most people who have had a housekeeper before will understand when I say that. A housekeeper is present even when the housekeeper isn't present. And probably why when first asked by police on who could do this or who had access to the house, both of the Ramses mentioned Linda Pugh first. Mervyn, another suspect, hold her in the basement, messed with her, bringing her in and out of consciousness, torturing her and sexually assaulting her with a foreign object. The stun gun marks were presumably put on her after she screamed, and they showed her that when she screams, she will feel this. They now had to sit out for a few hours until one of the Ramses woke up and found the ransom note. In this theory, when looking at the facts, time of death is not definitive, but more of a possible window of time. So if she was killed earlier than my guess of approximately 5.52 a.m. as her time of death, it still wouldn't change our theory, being that if killed on accident earlier than that, it doesn't take away the fact that th why they were there, for the ransom money. Cops were called, and they were gone. Although handwriting experts have stated that the author of the ransom note was clearly educated, they might have not taken into consideration that it might possibly have been pre-written days before or even weeks, and we also feel it was put together by more than one person, hence sounding educated. These kidnappers were not very smart, but they were smart enough to make us all think that they were smart, and smart enough to get away with it for over 20 years. And the content on the ransom note was definitely not written off the cuff. These suspects were dreamers and bent on getting cold hard cash and were meticulous in their planning. If the motive was money, why not steal jewelry and other valuables from the house while the Ramses were gone? Because if things were missing or looked disturbed or out of place, the Ramses might have noticed and maybe called the police or never went to sleep, which would have thrown a monkey wrench into the entire kidnap for ransom plan. Here is where I feel most people get thrown for a loop. The ransom note was actually a ransom note and not a diversion. However, a lot of the actual content in the ransom note was used as a diversion, trying to point more suspicion towards the Ramses and away from themselves. But it was nevertheless a ransom note. The sexual assault might have been staged. It helped Linda raise more suspicion on the Ramses later on, when in fact the Ramses never physically or sexually abused their children, they never even spanked their children, and there were never reports of any previous abuse. The death and possible rape of a little six-year-old girl pageant queen on its own made this a big case, but it sadly took away from what really happened. It planted a type of sexual motive in our heads that left us sad and disgusted of what might have possibly happened to this poor little girl, when in fact the motive was first and foremost, cash money. Did one or more of the suspects have ulterior motives? Most likely. Did they act on it? Probably. But the primary motive for all of the suspects in this case was money. Let's just say the safe was empty and everybody knew it. It was still where the plot first came about. Pretend the safe wasn't involved at all. Ramses were known for being wealthy and were prime candidates now targeted for ransom. Whoever did this wanted money and they could have John come up with that amount of money without getting the police or the FBI involved. What people said about the drawing on JonBenet's hand was that it resembled a heart, but when it turned, it looked like a smiley face. Two eyes, one almost touching the smile. It doesn't change anything, being that children will often draw on their own hands. The drawing on the hand doesn't seem to be a major factor in the case. Another reason why the case was diverted was because the DNA and fingerprints for at least two of the murderers have been there the whole time, and justifiably so, being that they worked at the Ramsey home. And these kidnapped for ransom criminals wore gloves and left no seminal fluid behind and wiped the body clean. Yes, it was intruders. Intruders that were close to the family, with the keys, knew the layout of the entire house, as well as the Ramsey schedule. Yes, the ransom note author sounded educated, but let me point out a few things. Number one, listen carefully. How can you listen? Do you mean read carefully? Two, we are a group of individuals. Every group is a group of individuals. <laughs> three, copying the ransom note when the misspellings occurred, nervousness. Four, two or three people contributed to ideas 
to what eventually went on the ransom note. Five, it was written at an unknown, lo unknown location days or weeks before Christmas. The following is from the movie Ransom starring Mel Gibson. Opening date, November 8th, 1996. I want $2 million in 50s and 100s, no consecutive serial numbers, no new bills, no marked bills. Money will fit in two Samsonite hard shell suitcases, model 260. Do not involve the police or the FBI. If you do, I will kill him. Do not inform the media or I will kill him. You have 48 hours to get the money. I will contact you. If you so much as remove your wristwatch, your son dies. We'll be watching you, Tom. Sound a little familiar, don't you think? I can bet money the Pew crew went and saw the movie in their local movie theater between November 8th and December 25th. They were well known for being movie buffs. I will paint the next example as two movies. It's the only way I know how to explain it. Bear with me. Number one, Ransom, Hollywood version, starring Mel Gibson. Child abducted by a group of individuals. Ransom amount, $2 million. Amount of time to get money, 48 hours. Money will be put in two Samsonite hard shell suitcases. Two, Ransom, ghetto YouTube version, starring the Pew crew. Child abducted by a group of individuals. Ransom amount, $118,000. Amount of time to get money, four hours. Money was planned to go in a Samsonite hard shell suitcase. This also explains why the blue suitcase was there. The plan was if they got their $118,000 ransom money, it would fit there perfectly just like it did in the movie Ransom. A lot of material found on the note came from various action thriller movies besides Ransom, including Speed, The Deer Hunter, The Fugitive, Die Hard, in which the term foreign faction was taken from. Death of an Innocent by Linda Hoffman Pugh. I realize this book was never published, but it pretty much a confession to murder using misdirection to place the guilt elsewhere. The smartest thing that Linda ever did was how she set up the Ramses to take the fall, sold it to the world, and everybody bought it, and she did it just to cover her and her husband's ass. Linda is a cold and calculating evil woman whose motives were money, jealousy, envy, and hatred. Linda plotted this kidnap for Ransom so well that she even took the small notes that Patsy wrote her home and later used them as a guide for the ransom note and specifically how to aim anything and everything away from the pew crew and throw it heavily on the ramses even in front of a grand jury she specifically stayed on pattern of imitating certain individual letters and characteristics that patsy used and made them a part of the ransom note ransom note she plotted and planned this to the t only part of the plan that failed was getting the one hundred eighteen thousand dollar ransom money these kidnappers really thought they could pull this off and more planning went into this operation than most people might think they were very unseasoned criminals and grandois in their way of thinking. How they got away with it for this long blows my mind. The police department must make things right for all the mistakes and accusations and false accusations they've made for the past 20 years. Jean Bonnet and the entire Ramsey family at least deserve that. Open your eyes and realize that what you saw happen really did happen. The reason this case has been so hard to solve and for so long is because of the countless possible theories in this case. I believe this is the only one in which the primary motive was money and can be directly connected to explain the pineapple in her stomach, why she was murdered, and finally understand and decipher the contents of the strange and now famous ransom note. So as you begin your own investigation, once you dismiss the ransom note, it goes in every direction and nowhere at all. Random notes. When you Google JonBenet crime scene, the very first picture is the wine cellar room with the floor safe showing. So the safe is a very big clue in the case. And Linda and Mervyn's daughter, Ariana Pugh, was 13 at the time of the murder. I bet she can answer a lot of our questions. She was in their inner circle. And what did she hear happened? If Mervyn Pugh's DNA has not been collected yet, it needs to be because he was one of the murderers. Through our investigation, we found out that Mervyn was cleared through familial DNA using Ariana Pugh. However, she is not their daughter, but is actually Linda's granddaughter from a previous marriage. What? Ariana and Mervyn are not blood related. The movie theater in Boulder that was showing Ransom might have video footage of the Pew crew going in to watch the movie. And if not, I bet there were people that remembered seeing them there at the movies. And when people start getting arrested and pieces of the puzzle start fitting together so perfectly, the court of public opinion might even think that I probably had something to do with it. Victory SBTC, signed by the captain. What? And in my heart, I feel that if Linda dies, she will leave a confession behind. But right now, her heart is heavy, and I know she wants to finally tell the truth and accept responsibility for what she did. She will now know that everybody knows, and I always felt that the actual murderer of Jean Bonnet was by the hands of an ex-military and practiced using the garret on animals before, and Helgoth was ex-military. 
He did not commit suicide. He was murdered because the kidnap for ransom plan failed and that he might eventually talk. He was the weakest link. Helgoth had a hat which read SBTC, had a stun gun next to his dead body, as well as a pair of high-tech boots which matched the description of one of the shoe prints found on the crime scene. Question, was the gunshot residue ever found on either of Helgoth's hands after his death? If the contents of the safe weren't described in the police report, it speaks volumes about why they redacted it and blocked it out on the official affidavit for the search warrant after the death of Jean Benet at the Ramsey home. Being, if what was to be found on court documents, it must also be found at the scene and described in the warrants as to items found. They never said what, if anything, was found in the safe, hence the redaction of it in the affidavit for the search warrant. And on the list of items found in the search, there is also an item blacked out and redacted on the reports. So question, if the safe had nothing, why not just say nothing instead of so much covering up and hiding it from the public on actual unsealed legal court documents? We the people have the right to know. Rest in peace, Shamanay Ramsey. Condolences and prayers go out to her and her family. Now clean the slate. Minus all the names of the cast and characters you've ever heard of in the case, this was a kidnapping, a child was taken from a bedroom. 911 call. My child was kidnapped and I left a ransom note. Police show up. Ransom note said, get the money, follow the rules, or your daughter is dead. We will get call between 8 and 10 a.m., 8, 9 a.m., no call, deadline 10 a.m., still no call, no sign of the girl, time elapses, noonish, still nothing. The detective, who has never been in charge of a kidnap for ransom crime scene, justifiably so, decides to request the father to search the house. Father and friends search the house. In the basement, in the very back, there's an unused wine cellar. Father opens the door and girl was found dead. Father grabs her, takes her upstairs. I found her, my own baby girl, dead with her hands tied, duct tape over her mouth, and rope very tight around her neck. He sets her down. The detective now begins to clear the house until there's only police officers, detectives, and a dead little girl in the living room choked to death. Who does that? Let's take a look at what happened. The father didn't follow the rules. There were three pages to read to make sure he read this ransom note carefully. Very carefully. It was addressed to the father. We are the people who took your daughter. Rules on the ransom note basically don't call the cops, gather up the money, no funny business, or we kill her. We will call you between 8 and 10 a.m. Must I point out rule number one, probably the most important rule in the rule of rule books. This one happens to read, don't call the cops. Rule number one broken. Cops show up, presumably with their silence, sirens blaring when they got there, and probably parked in the marked squad cars outside. Reminder, kidnappers stated that they would be watching. Now, where can the kidnappers be? In a hotel, in a remote area in the woods, in a garage next door? Nobody knows. All they know is she's not in her bedroom. But in a timeline with the ransom note, the paper that you will read because your daughter was abducted from her own bedroom, and to get her back alive, you better get the money and follow the rules or they will kill her. And it ended up being all too real. Now we have a dead girl who was kidnapped from her home and her own father had to find her in his really big nice house. Let's just say a lot of square footage. She was found dead in the basement. Who could have done this? I'm no genius, but my guess would probably be the kidnapper or kidnappers. Whoever wrote the damn note killed my daughter in the basement of my own damn house. Why? Because remember when the note you read, the note that was left by somebody who abducted your daughter, did you do what you were supposed to do? What do you mean? Well, you and your wife woke up, she finds a few pages on some stairs, starts to read it, screams, runs to her room, she's not in there, looks in her brother's room, not in there, mother shows father ransom note, parents pace around in a panic thinking what the hell is going on here. The key to saving your daughter's life is to follow the rules and she won't end up dead. Not sure if the parents read the rules that the letter said to save their daughter's life well enough. Now that we understand that whoever this suspect is, or suspects, they took a girl out of the bedroom, out of her bedroom, left some rules and orders to get money, not a million, that's for the movies, a town of approximately 90K in this city is 96, in 1996. Ask for the 118,000, same as the check stub you found. Good idea, so while they're gone, are we gonna kick in the front door? Nah, that's a really big house, and I already scoped it out, and there's windows in the basement, the basement with the safe and the jewels, all that gold. Yep, and that's her face, has the keys to get in because she's clean there. She cleans there. It's Christmas. How can they go to the bank and get our ransom money? Well, it's Christmas and it's Wednesday. I googled it, so tomorrow is Thursday. Our bank's open on a Thursday. I reckon so. Okay, just checking. Friday, too. So after they all fall asleep, one of us takes her out of her room, takes her to the bottom of her own big house we've been studying since they've always been out of town, and she'll leave the ransom note where they can see it. Good idea. What if they don't see it? Well, time will go on and maybe Mama or Papa haven't seen her and they see her missing. No matter what, whether the girl was found missing from her own room by the parents or not, the ransom note was going to have to be found. If it was never found, let's just say mother's making breakfast, dad is reading the paper, 8, 9, 10 a.m., some kids sleep later, eventually either the brother or one of the parents would see that she's not in her room and look around. 
When would a parent even suspect their child is missing? And the mother notices she's missing, and what does she do? Scream? No, because she has no reason to think anything if she hasn't found the well-placed ransom note. You would start looking around, probably calling the girl's name, check her mother's room to see if she was in there. Nope. Runs into the husband. Have you seen what's her name? No. Why? She's not in her room or the living room, the kitchen, the brother's room. Maybe we should start calling her name. No answer. Yelling her name. No answer. End result in this scenario. If the entire house was searched, they probably wouldn't would have eventually found her or them. If not, regardless, the cops would have been called. But it didn't happen that way. Why? Because luckily they found that good old handy dandy ransom note we left behind. Did you put it in a good spot so that they'll find it? I hope so. Well, at the end of the story is that they did find the ransom note and we waited for the money. We are hoping he follows the rules that were put on the ransom note. Remind me the rules again. Well, rule number one, don't call the police or the FBI. We got your daughter. What did you write for the money part? That's my favorite part. Well, what's her face? Who came up with the idea? 118000 Why don't we ask for a million? He's rich. A million might raise suspicion because where would he have a million dollars? I bet he's got at least a million in gold in that safe you showed me earlier and diamonds. Now, let's be realistic. If he has at least 118000 in the safe down there, he will come down and get it. And then we have him open it and kill them both. If he doesn't come down here, it means nothing. It means there ain't nothing in the safe. So maybe the father will go to the bank and withdraw the money, and bring it back, and we kill them all. You think they will listen carefully about the rules to get our money, and for him to get his daughter back? Hope so. I mean, this plan actually doesn't seem that dumb when you really think about it. Evidence pointing to the pews. One, the pews had black duct tape, wet, n white nylon cording, same notepad and pen. Two, they had recently been in the wine cellar. Three, they knew of the broken window. Four, they had a key to the house. Five, they had access to John's payroll stubs. Six, they needed money. Seven, they knew the Ramseys were going to Charlevoix the next day. Eight, there was a two-foot piece of nylon white cord with a stick tied to it found at their home. Nine, Linda volunteered the meaningful information that Jean Bonnet had an ongoing bedwetting problem. Ten, she knew where the knife was hidden. Eleven, she knew where Patsy kept her paint tote. Twelve, Linda cannot be excluded as the author of the ransom note. 13, the pews watched a lot of television, especially movies. 14, they were home the night of the murder. 15, as the grand jury was still deciding, Linda was at the courthouse handing out packets of six handwriting experts' analysis of Patsy's handwriting. That's interesting. 16, her alibi means nothing when she has the key and alarm code to share with others. 17, if Linda was in charge of doing the laundry, why would Patsy keep track and have known what was in the dryer? 18, Linda publicly stated that Patsy had multiple personalities, even though Patsy was under doctor care and never heard of any mental health issues. 19A, she went from saying how sweet Patsy was to later being the biggest advocate and trying to get her tried and convicted. B, Police Handbook 101, suspects often point the finger at other suspects. 20, when the police asked the shaken up Ramseys who could have done this or who had access to their house, both John and Patsy's first name they said was Linda Pugh. They didn't think she could do something like that, but looks are deceiving. 21. Linda knew what dress Jean Bonnet had on for the Christmas party and what Patsy was wearing, even though she told the cops she wasn't there. What? That's a big one. 22. Being that Linda was a possible suspect, how would she even be allowed to testify in front of a grand jury that was aimed at the Ramseys being responsible for the death of Jean Bonnet? 23. Patsy was warm and kind, just a sweet person. She was doing a lot of charity work and was involved with her children's schooling, said Linda. Yet, she testified for eight hours be before a grand jury saying how Patsy must have murdered her own daughter. In addition, the people who continually say that this case was tainted from the start and that it will never be solved are not part of the solution. Yes, proper procedure might not have been followed and obvious mistakes were made, but that's a speed bump in the case that yields a lot more evidence than most murder cases by far and a lot of evidence that wasn't tainted at all. So we all agree it was mishandled, but now that that is neither here nor there, work with what you've got. Rectify the situation, identify the perpetrators, make the arrests, and solve this case. And very importantly, while looking at this crime, what happened leading up to her death isn't as important as the death itself, which is a homicide. So the crime of homicide is priority number one. What led up to it, you will find out later. And for those still on the fence, weigh these two out. Number one, if the Ramseys did have something to do with the murder of their daughter, then yes, I hope they burn in hell because they eventually have to answer to someone. However, two, if the Ramseys didn't do it, this family for over 20 years now has lived the saddest, strangest, and most bizarre horror story, worse than the scariest movie out there. Husband and wife, humble beginnings, worked hard, acquired wealth, had children, owed multiple beautiful homes. They lived in a beautiful home and felt safe. It started as a normal day. So basically, I've almost solved the 20-year-old unsolved homicide murder case, which happens to be one of the biggest in recent U.S. history by using common sense. Boulder, Colorado Police Department employed a lot of professionals and even the FBI and Secret Service involved, so, that, so why should it be me, an ex-felon recovering drug addict, living in a garage in Modesto, California, IA, to be the one to tell you how to handle a crime scene investigation 101 and standard kidnap protocol. 
Okay, so this theory is being put forth by an ex-felon recovering drug addict. Okay. Why do you think this very logical path of investigation wasn't followed? My guess, being that the ransom note was so outlandish, most, if not all, people just dismissed it and moved on to different clues in the case since there are so many of them. See, no matter what your theory is, once you dismiss the ransom note, you're already doomed to fail and chasing your own tail. The power of inference is amazing. Now, please solve this case and worry about apologizing to the rest of the family that is still alive that you accused for so long. Some of the killers are still alive and must be held accountable. Nobody has more evidence than you. It's the least you can do for that little girl so she can finally rest in peace and the world can finally quit cashing in by pecking at her bones. My suggestion... I now believe there is sufficient physical and circumstantial evidence to show a probable cause to detain and interrogate both separately Linda Hoffman Pugh and Mervyn Pugh for the murder of Jean Benet Ramsey. Rest in peace, Jean Benet. Okay, so that's the Pugh crew theory. Now, a lot of people say it couldn't have been them because they were such simpletons, but let's think about this. If simpletons were going to commit a crime such as this, Perhaps that ransom note in their simpleton minds, the ransom note isn't as outlandish as it appears to be to more educated minds. Like maybe they don't think it's that strange or that crazy or, they, or that outlandish because they're all simpletons. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's really, really bizarre.